David, we started last week uh, with uh, wars and capital. We, we went a little bit more over the Deleuze war machine and uh, obviously the concept of deterritorialization, which is you know somewhat abstract. It doesn't really only refer to deindustrialization, like a lot of people like to point out in the 80s, this is what happened. You know, it's it's much richer than that in, in terms of uh, you know its conceptual um, you know force fields. So um, you know, and, and we're gonna we're gonna engage that. So we we went over last week a little bit of the uh, to our um, to our enemies section, and I, as I mentioned, um, you know, to our enemies section is a play on the invisible committees to our friends, which was their third work after they began the coming insurrection. And uh, yeah, and I, I recommend the theory of the young girl, and the young girl refers to people like me, Josh, and Patrick, as well as eighteen-year-olds, as well as you know, eighty-five-year-old uh, matriarchs, if you will. So anyway, it's a very interesting text that they wrote on uh, you know, kind of post-society of the spectacle, uh, the invisible community. But this is a this, in some ways, is an extension of their work and and. Uh, of the coming insurrection, but again, as I as I mentioned, these uh, both Lazzarato and Aliés were students of Gilles Deleuze, and to me, uh, this work is the culmination of close of forty years of research. Let me just situate it once again um, uh, from the seventies, early seventies, post sixty eight, in Deleuze's classes on deterritorialization on the post anti Oedipus moment, on capital, even though Deleuze never directly engaged Marx and Marxist capital, he did have working notes uh, uh, entitled The Grandeur of Marx, uh, you know, and he, uh, and he was, was leaving that, that's in his estate. I don't know how much there are, you know, I've heard rumors up to, you know, multiple hundreds of pages and as little as 25 to 30. So I, I don't know. I mean, you know, but anyway, again, the, the, they were both present there in this kind of post 68, you know, anti, if you will, um, Hegelian Marxism uh, that was uh, uh, somewhat dominant in France be between Sartre, uh, Kojève, um, and and others and uh, and especially the notion of the of the uh, totality, especially the expressive totality. So they're always working against this, and this is a, a work of of neologisms that have you know we will try to give an account of the neologisms because they use a lot of new vocabulary here. Um, obviously, tremendously also influenced by the work of Michel Foucault. Who had emerged by 1970 as a you know a major figure in French academic life. 1970, he took Claude Lévi-Strauss's uh, chair at the Collège de France, and began with the famous uh, discourse on language, which was a kind of recapitulation of his earlier work, the order and uh, words and things, and of course the archaeology of knowledge, in which again a highly abstract to most people's minds. But once you get into it, it's not so abstract, a notion of the, the concretization of discursive regularities and how they play out in certain epistemological regu regulations and regulate the way we think in a particular period. And Foucault you know, thought of the three levels of what we're engaged in, which are labor, life, and political economy. These were life, life labor, and language linguistics, political economy, and biology were the three disciplines that he saw us really constituted by today. And hence from that, he came up with the lectures on the birth of biopolitics, which opened up a whole new field of inquiry, um, you know, that in some ways displaced, but at the same time may have enhanced, and we can talk about this, the notion of class struggle and struggle of, of classes together, you know, uh, this, this could be, a, again, an interesting discussion. Uh, Foucault uh, seminars at the Collège de France, this is a nice thing that goes on in France, is that they choose a topic for the year, right? And the person that is in ch the charge of the Collège de France gives a lecture. So his first lecture was on psychiatric power, and then the abnormal, because he had this tremendous interest and still do, does madness in civilization or the really literally the history of madness. 
<laughs> his big tome, which was 640 pages. The American and English audiences got about 140 in the abridged edition. Yeah, now, the, now the major edition is out. But uh, anyway, this this uh, this really started Michel Foucault's quote popular career, if you will. But at the same time, after going through psychiatric power and the abnormal, these early studies of the marginal and, and madness and, and, and this uh, notion between uh, uh, pathology and the normal, you know, which I think is very relevant today. And I, I do suggest as a, as a footnote again, to reread or read George Conquillon's The Normal and the Pathological. It's a classic work on how we come to normative standards Right, and how we articulate this language of the crazy versus the sane, sane and insane. You know, the classifications that are operative in diagnostic standard manuals, one through, I guess, five, they're into five now, or six, who knows, with all the new pathologies, right? And um, anyway, um, so he, he engaged this early on, and then he went on to start studying security, territory, and population, which was an extension of his work on the birth of the prison and the panopticon, uh, Discipline and Punish, in particular, was the name of the book, better titled in Fran Fr France, <laughs> Inspect and Surveil, <laughs> right? It's a nicer title and then Discipline and Punish, but the, again, the English translation is, is Discipline and Punish. And again, a book that took over in many criminology departments, many sociology uh, departments, et cetera, and it became a kind of landmark text in, in terms of, you know, criminology and, and looking at the birth of the modern uh, prison, um, you know, and actually a very accurate, I think, and, and uh, original rereading of Jeremy Bentham's, you know, Panopticon, the architecture of the modern prison, you know, and I think he retained this throughout his career. From there, he started to move in the direction of looking at security, population, and territory. So I'm doing this because this is what Aliez and, and uh, you know, um, uh, Lazzarato are encountering. And they were present at many of these lectures. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, I know for a fact that Lazzarato was, and I would suspect that, uh, you know, um, you know, of course, um, um, uh, Adias was too. Yeah. So um, anyway, to, to, to go back to here. So then he, he goes into the birth of biopolitics, which I said opened up a whole field that is, you know, very, very actively uh, uh, taught in schools, you know, which really actually looks at population, territory and security, and some of the, you know, interesting work of that period, you know, is um, uh, Thomas Lemke, uh, from Germany, uh, wrote a very good book on the biopolitical. The main person in Italy is Roberto Esposito. You know, he's taken this up. Negre and Hart take up the lectures of the biopolitical in their early work and their, their work, Empire, Multitude, Multitude Commonwealth, and uh, Assembly. And the fifth volume, by the way, I understand is on the way. Negre is now, uh, he was born the same year as Aronowitz, uh, still alive is in Venice. So he's uh, 80, 89 now. Um, um, yeah, uh, Negre's 89. And still supposedly going pretty strong in the mind. So, you know, and Michael Hart are co collaborating today. So Simon, also when the Deleuze lectures, the Foucault lectures at the Collège de France, all happening in the 1970s, Tony Negre was uh, allowed into France. Most of you probably know he was, he was uh, uh, convicted of being the quote, head theorist of the, the Rosa Brigado. And, you know, he was implicated, I don't think ever convicted of being part of the Moro kidnapping, the Aldo Moro uh, kidnapping uh, at that time, but he, he was jailed and he escaped to France. And while in France and actually Gilles Deleuze and more particularly Felix Boitari, you know, brought him into to France and they gave him very self safe passage. And Deleuze, by the way, I have a copy of the letter. It's not with me, it's somewhere in Brooklyn. But, but anyway, um, beautiful letter on behalf of Negre to the French government, right? Now, that he wrote that the man should be given, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, exiled, uh, should be even made a citizen. I think it even went that, that far. So Negre through Louis Althusser, and I'll go back to him too, because I think this book is very interesting in the way it uses Althusser. Um, uh, Althusser uh, gave Negre a space in his seminar, and this was the famous reading of the Grundrisse. 
you know, that took place in the late 70s. Lessons on the Grundrisse. 10, 10 seminars on the reading of the chapter on money and then the chapter of the transformation of money into capital. And this, this was a very, very significant rereading and rethinking of Marx, right? There's no, you know, that really upset, again, the monthly review crowd, the dominant political economists of the day, you know, everybody, were, you know. So Negre kind of carved out a territory that was very imaginative at the same time, started then to incorporate the work of Foucault into his own, you know, and Deleuze. You know, and, uh, you know, and he said he was rebaptized in the River Seine, you know, by the quote unquote post 68 crowd, or if you want to refer to him as post structuralists uh, in some way. So, so Negre was very much of this influence of the old, you know, Italian left, the Autonomia uh, media, media uh, groups, uh, the Zero Work Group, and uh, also, of course, uh, you know, very interesting uh, work with Mario Tronti, whose works are now being translated into English. Workers and Capital has just come out, and Tronti was very much on the ground. And I want uh, people to realize that Negre and uh, Tronti and this group, uh, Francois um, uh, Peperno and Serge Bologna, all worked on the ground with workers. They were part of very militant struggles and strikes in Italy, you know, and, and many times violent strikes. So Italy was not a place where you just march and put the rat outside, right? <laughs> there was a very different level, as you probably know from the movies, uh, you know, or if you know any Italians that participated in these, they, they don't mess around, you know? <laughs> so so uh, anyway, all to say, um, uh, so Negre comes out of a very concrete, you know, group of, of terms, you know, uh, uh, et cetera. And uh, again, he's in discussion constantly with Foucault, who dies in 84, you know, untimely death in 84. And then Deleuze, who basically, uh, you know, committed, uh, I mean, Deleuze couldn't breathe anymore. That's why he jumped to his death. He, he, he actually left a note that said he wanted to feel again. Yeah, he had no lungs, you know, and he was a chain smoker. He used to, if you've ever heard, I mean, I'll, I'll play it maybe next week. Uh, I have a, 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 an audio of his lectures on Spinoza where he says, close the door and then you can hear the long puff on the cigarette, right? And he would, you know, this is when you would smoke and, and you know, he was a chain smoker. So, you know, like a lot of these guys. So um, anyway, uh, to go, go back to this again. So these are some of the major uh, shapings of this 40 year old project, a return to, you know, what went wrong? What was the culmination of May 68? We already know that Stiegler, you know, uh, for the people that get work on Stiegler, has, has many, um, you know, critiques of May of 68. He called it a, the social pathology as the title of this in the lost spirit of capitalism. Um, we, we have the reactionaries, of course, the nouveau philosophes that probably you know about, Bernard-Henri Lévy, um, Andre Glucksmann, who has passed away, Lévy is not yet, um, you know, um, and um, uh, Christian Jambert, uh, among others. Bernard-Henri Lévy became the spokesman up front. Uh, by the way, his family owns major rubber plantations in Africa. And, uh, you know, this is French ruling class, you know, you know, and uh, his, his, to me, the best thing he ever wrote was on interrogation in Argentina during the time of the missing. Yeah, and he wrote this for Sartre and uh, Merleau-Ponty and Simone de Beauvoir's journal, uh, Tom Modern, back in the late 60s. But he wrote a book that basically was an attack on the French left and uh, called Barbarism with a Human Face. And uh, that was his uh, his uh, his uh, thing. And Andre Glucksmann came through with The Master Thinkers and then Cynicism and Passion were his two major books. And now Levy, American, I forgot the name of the movie, Traveled Through America. He's all over the place, as you, as you know, uh, you know, in, in the United States. He's got extremely high level contacts among the neocons, between the left liberal uh, Jewish intelligentsia. There are many, many levels to Levy's involvement. So he became an antagonist. I mean, you know, obviously directly uh, with Alain Badiou, you know, uh, but also to this group, 
which was, you know, very much marginalized and, and never really taught in the schools. Foucault and, and obviously Derrida had a presence, but Badiou is a, an invention of recent date in terms of the import. Uh, Aliaz never took hold here. And Deleuze is read, but I don't know how serious, you know, in a way, and how much it's really engaged, even though there are, you know, websites, there's the Swarm website, uh, you know, for Swarm Intelligence which is uh, taken up by uh, some people. So, so anyway, this book, again, is, is, is very indebted to a, a long history. And, and it seems to me that the problematic is really about, first of all, what is originary uh, accumulation? And they use that term. They also use a translation of initial that they take up from Jean-Pierre Lefebvre, uh, a name not known in the United States either, who's a major translator of Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. He's both a Heine and a, and a uh, Hegel scholar, a Jean-Pierre Lefebvre, no relation to Henri Lefebvre, the philosopher. So uh, he was the one reading of Capital or, or, or Sprung, or Sprung, you know, and this is in the text. Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can see this uh, at work. I think it's on page, uh, 56, yeah, it's mentioned in the reading for tonight. Um, so um, anyway, uh, um, uh, and to go back to Althusser, I think this is very interesting the way they begin with Althusser is it's, it's how we ask the history of the questions. You know, this is what has to be confronted. And this is on in the introduction on page 33, the postscriptum. And I think this is a very important thing to remember uh, for us. Uh, the book is placed under the sign of an impossible, quote unquote, uh, parentheses, master of politics, or more precisely, the Althusserian adage. And I, I think this is something that really is, is very crucial to, to keep working on, you know, forged in the corner of a historical materialism in which we, you know, recognize ourselves. So in this mirror, if you want to know a question, do the history of it. This is very interesting. If you want to know a question, you know, do a history of it. I always say about philosophy, what philosophy teaches is not answers, but it teaches you hopefully how to ask the question properly, right? <laughs> or in a way that really creates a path, a real path of questioning. And I like this too, alongside that, if you want to know a question, do the history of it, right? So 68 was a major deviation from the laws of Althusserianism. And again, they show this reaction at work and all that they represent, it will be the flight diagram of a second volume. And obviously, I don't know when this is coming out, but this, this was finished in 2016. So I would suspect wars and, and, and revolution will be out very soon. And you know, we had a good weekend if you look at electoral politics, you know, it's good. Uh, you know, a win in Colombia, a kind of win in France. That's that's tenuous because Marine Le Pen is quite clearing victory. Her party got the most <laughs> most uh, new representation. The, you know, of course, the 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 popular front, the, the 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 national front. I'm sorry, which is the most popular of the fronts. But uh, the unity of the left around Mélenchon did get a showing at least. You know, the first time this has happened really since the 70s. So, so maybe there's something coming back around. You know, there were victories in Chile, right? Mexico walked out of this uh, group, you know, so uh, with, uh, with Biden and company, with Washington. So you're beginning to see at least glimpses, if you will. I mean, you know, I mean, and let's hope they morph into more. You know, you basically have an M17, I think it's M17, uh, you know, and they're going to renegotiate with FARC in Colombia. This is significant. You know, I mean, this is really significant in, in Colombia, you know, in a way, the home of the cartels, the a US outpost in many ways, uh, et cetera. And, uh, you know, again, uh, maybe one can write the essay, the autumn, uh, the new autumn of the patriarchs uh, playing on Garcia Marquez. Yeah, so anyway, we, we're, we're witnessing this, but let me just go through here again. We propose to take up the study of the strange revolution of 68, and of its consequences where the train of the counter-revolution hides many others. A multiplicity of counter-revolution in the forms of restorations. So this is something that I really like about this book in my, my, my view is that 
they're really on top of reformism and restoration very actively. They really understand this very well. And I think this is, again, this vocabulary and this force that, that, um, that uh, Deleuze, Guattari have bequeathed them and what they take up in their very original way is giving them a, a lot to work with. They will be analyzed from the point of view of a theoretical practice, and that's the language of Althusser. You know, theory is a practice. It is not just theorized, you know, it's a practice. It, you know, this is the realm that's always working. And this distinction between theory and practice is really broken down even more by Althusser than it is by Gramsci, who starts this, this breaking of the distinction early on in, uh, in uh, the 1930s in the prison notebooks, in the late 20s and early 30s. So in the mindset, we will attempt, and this goes back to Stiegler too, and, and I'm, and I'm you know, again, if we, you know, we're really doing this, you know, rigorously and we had, uh, you know, Harvard funding uh, where we want to make uh, our reparations for being on the left, uh, we would read The New Spirit of Capitalism by Cipello and um, Eva Cipello and um, um, uh, Luke Blazowski, right? And uh, anyway, the artistic critique, the notion of the artistic critique, which Stiegler criticizes, if you remember, from um, you know the social pathology of '68, you know, in in capitalism, I like to call the book "Capitalism Has Lost Its Mind" because it really has. I mean, when you really take a look at this now today, I mean, even on calculative rational principles, it's, it's not operating too well. So, both the most up to date and the most regression version of workerism of accelerationism. Right, and that's a very popular movement. I mean, maybe David Winters or some of the younger people here can speak to that. How acceleration has captured some people, you know, out there, and uh, of course, speculative realism, another movement that is out there. And we have therefore decided not to include it up in our reading of the Anthropocene. Okay, but they are going to engage here. If you want to know the question, do the history of it, right? And the over determined by the warring realities of the of the present. Another term taken from Freud, over determination, right? That that is used by Althusser in the classic essay, over determination and contradiction. His real encounter with Hegelian formal contradiction and and using Freud to read read Hegel in many ways. Freud and Lacan to really read Hegel. So this overdetermined, you know, notion of concepts and the warring realities of our present time. So we can we can we can speak to this. So anyway, again, for the people that weren't here, I'm just trying to re-situate this. Um, you know, um, um, and again, they they're using language of Marx consistently, um, you know, to both respect, but also as points of departure, such as general intellect. You know, uh, this, this is a very interesting, you know, use, if you will, of the terminology. And again, I want to emphasize, these are people that are educated in capital. I mean, we're not, not just in capitalist system, but they're educated in a serious reading of Marx from very early on in their careers. And this is not something that they're just saying, uh, we don't know, or we're just, you know, dismissing out of hand. There's a lot of working through going on here much, much the same, you know, in some ways. So, um, um, you know, um, uh, and I also like this too, um, in, in section number 30 on page um, 32, it is, it is, it is it not, it is not a question, it is not all a question of stopping resistance. It is a question of dropping a re theorism satisfied with a strange discourse that is powerless in the face of what is happening. So they are really against this kind of, you know, powerless theorization, this powerless and endless back and forth based on similar languages, right? Rehearsals of the past in a certain way in the face of what has happened. And what has happened to us? Because if the related me mechanisms of power are constitutive to the detriment of strategic relationships. And this is interesting. This is a, a term of Foucault's strategic relationships and the wars taking place there that can only be a phenomena of resistance again then. You know, and then they go on with the success we all know. Yeah, Chris, uh, uh, Dossett. 
So anyway, um, you know, so maybe maybe I can ask. I, I know David o. Winters was very much tonight. Uh, you know, we we went a little bit into state war machine and money, the triad that is constantly being used here. Obviously, they're privileging financialization and and the public debt. It's not only just Goldman Sachs. It's the U.S. government and other governments in the world. It's not Morgan Stanley. It's not, you know, just the investment banking houses. And most of you probably know the repeal of Glass-Steagall, you know, allowed firms such as Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley to go in the banking business. Mm -hmm. You know, there was no longer a distinction between, you know, banking, right, for as deposit depository institutions and lending institutions versus that of investment banks who write IPOs and, you know, and other, other kind of financial instruments. So in, in some ways, we are looking here at the financial architecture of our time. And I like this as related to that of war. You know, if we want to look at the financial, I mean, I like to call it a very elaborate paper mache that has not, you know, fallen yet. I mean, it's a very elaborate web of paper mache instructions in some ways. It's really fictitious capital at work. And this, I admire this. From my, my standpoint, I admire this kind of delving into fictitious capital in this way. It's all too easy just to see where money's allocated at the Pentagon. Yeah. It's a different story to understand this on an international basis and see what's happening. And I like the way they go back in history to do this. There are many, many thrive. So maybe I should hear from you. Um, you know, again, uh, the lessons on the Grundrisse is where they're, 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 they're riffing off of Negre in the first chapter, state war machine and, um, and uh, money. And a lot of the, uh, as you know, the anti-Oedipus and, uh, you know, the, uh, the relationship between Norman Misa and economy and what Solon's laws were really about in terms of realignment. So again, they're very good at going back to ancient history. And, and again, I emphasize, you, you all know I'm a Francophile. You know, at least at this level, I don't like the, you know, the French today, fast cars, clean bodies, the Kristen Ross, uh, uh, you know, account of France. But, but in terms of it, the intelligentsia and the edu educational system, the contributions are so vast and so, so origin original in a way, you know, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not saying they're always right, but just so provocative and so deep to my mind. So they'll, they'll, they have a lot of ammunition to go with, including, you know, but they also go into Ronald Reagan's early handler at GE. I don't know if you got to some of those parts. Or they go into the, uh, the uh, Mount Pelerin Society and Frederick Hayek and how these things were formed. You know, so there are all kinds of moves from John Locke and John Stuart Mill to the free market economies post-World War II. Uh, on the one side, on the other side, this going back to ancient history and, and thinking of, you know, how the reformist moments took place, how, how revolution, excuse me, how wars and capital really operate early on. And I thought their section on the enclosures was also very good, you know, just, just, you know, on the surface. So maybe I'll ask people, so we can go through this. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, hopefully tonight we can, we can do um, one, um, one, two, um, um, and uh, three, you know, uh, the state war machine money, uh, the uh, the section on of obviously Foucault, John Locke, uh, you know, uh, racism and race war, what what they're trying to do there, and then and then they go into the two histories of the French Revolution. I think we all know that, you know, that you have um, of course the Klaus Witzian war machine at work and his thinking about war that comes out of it and the Napoleonic uh, wars, right? And, and uh, how Clausewitz becomes the leading war uh, historian and thinker. And then of course the Haitian revolution, the Santo Domingo uprising of 1791, you know, and of course James's, CLR James's great book, The Black Jacobins being the major uh, text on that, but a lot of advances ever since. And why is Haiti kept poor, you know? Uh, why are they still paying reparations to France, right? Right. In a way, Jamaica still plays reparations to the British Empire. You know, when you really start thinking about what are we paying for, 
You know, what, the, what is this notion of reparations? It's not only about, and those of you that didn't see Emmy Goodman, an old colleague of mine many years ago, I haven't seen him. Craig Wilder was on today uh, um, on Amy Goodman talking about ebony and ivory and, and ivy. <laughs> ivory should go in there too. Ebony and, and Ivy is his book about how the Ivy League lead schools are built completely on slavery. Yeah. And he goes through how bodies were used in psychopathology. I don't know, David, do you know the work of, um, oh, what's it, Sanford Gilman, the psychoanalyst at Cornell? He wrote a book called Difference in Pathology. And he went, I haven't read it, but I yeah. read it. Good. It's a very good book. It's a very important book in terms of, you know, what happened in, in race and medicine. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So, so, but Wilder was really good. You can access it online for free. He talked about his book. It's been out for a few years, but he's updating it all the time. So anyway, so you have, we have the race situation. And then of course, the biopolitics of the permanent civil war, which I think we're in, you know, and now you hear the Pentagon, I guess you all have recognized, uh, you know, the Pentagon is coming out and saying, this is another endless war with Russia, right? This is what we're going to be doing in Ukraine. So the, this came a little bit earlier. I didn't expect this until September after the summer. So they're put there. They they beat me. To, I mean, I was wet ready to you know pr predict. Okay, this is coming in September, but they preempted anybody's anticipation. So I guess they're they're feeling acceleration in terms of, of time, right? So it's interesting how the, how this is really working in that way. And at the same time, listen, everybody talks about the economy, you know, going down. I mean, one thing we can consider or could be problematized is why is the dollar so strong if if the US stock markets are in such turmoil, you know, and that there's such problems with uh, inflation, you know, what is going on in this strengthening of the dollar, you know. I mean, the euro is a dollar five right now. When we put together this conference to go to Tecasos this uh, summer, about uh, four or five months ago, the euro was a, a, a buck 11. So you've had a decline of 6%, you know, just on the euro to US. Yeah. The commodity currencies, such as the Australian dollar and the Canadian dollar, are also down in relation to the US dollar. The ruble is up. So, you know, something strange is happening, you know, to play with Bob Dylan, something happening in here, you don't know what it is, do you, Mr. Jones? So anyway, uh, I think, I think uh, you know, this is worthy of consideration in financialization. Why is the strengthening of the dollar, why is this happening right now, you know, in, in many ways, you know, yeah. So does uh, this have something to do with expansion, you know, in terms of dollarism, you know, that you can buy more, you know, in terms of commodities, you know, your, your dollar spending better, you can buy foreign oil, you can make deals better with the Saudis, if you go to Venezuela, like they've done too, to get oil, etc. So, so just some questions, you know, there are some, some, uh, you know, marginal, marginal comments. So David, you want to start? I know you were taken uh, with, uh, you know, uh, David uh, Winters, I know you were taken with this, and I'm sure, you uh, your, your, uh, one of your uh, friends and mentor, uh, Jack Bradich, is uh, into this uh, kind of stuff, uh, I know, so. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, all true. Um, yeah, I've got like a, a, a lot of stuff. The, um, uh, well, I guess we'll return to the stuff that you were just talking about, Michael. I, I think um, a couple of the most interesting things um, in the economic moment um, that uh, Lazarado and, and LEAs give us some sort of uh, purchase um, to dive into maybe a little bit later uh, is, is also like the way that fighting inflation is being articulated by the entire ruling class as like the need to in increase scarcity, right? right. Like, as articulated by the folks making the decisions, interest rates have to be moved up in order to tame demand and cool the labor market, right? right. In, their, in their locutions, right? Yeah. When it's put to Jerome Powell, that what he's doing is increasing unemployment. At the last press conference last week, he literally said, we don't increase unemployment, we're cooling the labor market. I, I swear to God, like he did that kind of stern correction of the vocabulary, right? So like fighting inflation is just articulated across the ruling class, all of the primary definers as increasing a scarcity, right? Making jobs more scarce. And also um, the consumer, quote unquote, whatever that is, is articulated as being very strong after the help from the pandemic. So like 
on the one hand, Target has had to admit that it has way too much supply of stuff and it has to essentially give away a whole bunch of appliances because Target stores, they've got too much stuff in the warehouse. Right. At the same time, we're being told that uh, demand has to be cooled because the consumer is so strong. So interest rates are being raised in order to cool a, a hot consumer who also is somehow not spending enough money to buy all the shit that Target yeah. is supplying and anticipating for them. So like all of the supply and demand contradictions are already sharpening. Mm -hmm. And the, the way that the Fed perceives the only way to fight this is absolutely going to continue to sharpen those contradictions. And the Fed's not going to be able to, be able to explain it as it happens, right? So like all of that is, is fascinating and just moving forward at, at lightning speed. Um, even compared to 2008, 2009, which is like, like a, a very similar sort of trajectory. But the text, um, so I'm looking forward to talking about all that in more detail. The text though, if we wanted to start um, uh, like at the beginning where they, they talk about Foucault, where they talk about Greece, like uh, the, um, the introduction of, of, of like the hoplite as like a, 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 a technique of war and also like a social reality right. and the way that that social reality was like confirmed by the introduction of money mm -hmm. is, is something that I don't 100%, I, I don't totally get the mechanism there, like how money was used in order to secure the kind of hoplitic revolution. And like the, the way that they conceive of money as sort of forming in that moment, they use language that's almost like the Deleuze and Guattarian language of like the Orstadt uh, coming into being, like money comes into being at that moment, not for market purposes, for, but for power purposes. And under, then, under so I'm really interested in just what, what we make of that, those like three or four paragraphs. Yeah. And then the second the paragraph in those three or four paragraphs, I'm always going to be interested yeah. in how like policing fits into this right. and how like going back just a quick second to Deleuze and Guattari, like there's no or police for them. Like the police are always there with the state kind of and, and, and move with the state. And right. I like in my own head, like I'm exploring the idea that, that a kind of or police that's with the state but independent of the state is, is kind of functioning in all of these moments as well, where all of these theorists tend to wrap the police into the state and in different ways kind of a, like just attach them immediately. And I wonder if there's not like a, an independent logic. And I, that's just a question that I'm exploring. Okay. So like these four paragraphs also on my mind is how does the hot, the, the hot politic revolution create like a police within the polis that's part of this, this moment as, as well. Okay, good. Okay, that's a good starting point. Let me just back up just for one second, um, just to say, I mean, I'm sure everyone is aware of the fact that monetary policy has been ruling, you know, uh, cap late capital in the United States and globally, right? I mean, with Milton Friedman and the Chicago School of Economists, there are the extension of, by the way, of the 1947 Mike Pellerin Society, when Frederick Hayek went to them, Henry Hazlitt, et cetera. And they're well aware of this. They'll go there later. And I, I think this is interesting to look at Locke Mill and the Anglo moment, right, that they're very well aware of, uh, very, very, very uh, acutely aware of. And this is displacing something that some of us in this room grew up with, uh, you know, basically the fiscal policies of the Great Society and the post, you know, right after the Great Society that remained a little bit into the, the Carter year. That kind of that kind of moment where you had money that would go in, and the the rhetoric was always that the Republicans, well, the, the Democrats put money in the bottom, so that they can get a little piece of it as it tries to make its way back up to its elites. The the the, the, the Republicans put money in the top, thinking it's going to say it's going to trickle down, and it never rains, you know. So you know, it never trickles down. So th this is the difference between the two bosses, right? One, one wants to really screw the welfare pimp. And this is a very good section, by the way, on welfare and warfare states. And uh, uh, Beth, who's here, I don't know if she's uh, in the room now, but anyway, she, she knows a very good Foucaultian uh, text on, on the homeless, you know, of how this works in terms of, you know, capitalism and, and uh, you know, how these agencies are taken over. 
by the so-called welfare pimps, if you will, the, the, the welfare state, how it works out. And uh, so um, anyway, um, uh, yeah, that fight is on. And yeah, so why don't you tell us, I mean, I just wanted to say that, so there's no such thing as fiscal policy. You know, the, the Biden plan really doesn't exist, as you see. Who's talking about, you know, greenwashing right now? You know, the Green New Deal. How many times has that been in the media in 2022? You know, except a little bit peripherally. How much is single hair, care, health care, you know, Medicare for all hit the media? You know, how much is the student debt thing, you know, in terms of erasure of student debt? I mean, he's talking 10,000 now. You know, everything is downward. So the fiscal policy, this division that takes place with John Maynard Keynes, you know, Keynesianism is now basically Friedman Keynesianism. And of course, you know, this notion of human capital is what you're, you know, the whole resume culture is built upon the Chicago School of Economics. What is your human capital? What is your, what are you selling out there? That's Gary Becker at work. So this is 1973 and following that helped build, you know, towards the, the so-called Reagan revolution, right, uh, at that point. So again, you know, just, just framing it historically a little bit. So you have this, this major distinction, and we've been subjected, I think, for most of our adult life, to, to monetary, uh, you know, policies, and especially going on since, uh, you know, the, the late 1990s, 2000. You know, this went hand in hand financialization made Silicon Valley possible, right? You know, now, you know, what's made Zoom and other companies, you know, um, Digital Turbine and all these companies possible is a new kind of financialization called special project acquisition companies, you know, and all these other, th you know, things that are gone out. So, so you have all these, all these very, very, you know, interesting moments that we're now we're witnessing in finance capital, the deleveraging, right? This is really what's happening is a kind of deleveraging, you know, the bursting of certain bubbles to put it in another language, but really deleveraging of very bad financial investments and instruments. And if anybody's interested, the best place you can get, uh, you know, conservative money, you can get 9.2% out of series I savings bonds on an annual basis. And the interest rate is good until October 27th, seven, series I. The problem is you only can buy 10,000 of them. Not that I'm you know, going to you know, have all that spare change, but you're restricted to 10,000 per, per Social Security. So if you go to getting multiple Social Security numbers, you can buy a batch. But you know, only 10,000 each will the government allow you. But you got to figure there'll probably be close to half a million people buying these. And you know, this is one way they raise money and they have to pay out, you know, huge, huge interest on it. David uh, Salvage, did you want to say something or? or yeah. No, I was oh, just okay. absorbing. Was okay. All right. So, so um, anyway, just you know, to your first, uh, you know, the question. So we've been living, you know, now we're living with, um, um, with, um, we're living with, um, um, uh, you know, quantitative tightening, you know, the squeeze is on, as you would say, on the streets, you know. Yeah, you know, and uh, the squeeze is here, right in, in a sense. And of course, we don't know what the reverberations will be, right? In many ways, we really don't at this point. However, we have to try to think through where is the war in this, right? Okay. So, uh, David, why don't you say what, set, what, what, what pages you want to engage uh, in terms of the, the problem you want to uh, address? Uh, yeah, first. sure. Um, I'll, uh, I'm happy to read the. Uh, uh, <laughs> sure. Like to. Two paragraphs. So I'll start uh, page 36 with um, the start of the last paragraph, the institution of money. Yeah. So the institution of money, as Foucault asserts in his first course, uh, 70 to 71, focusing on its introduction in ancient Greece, cannot be explained for market, commercial, or mercantile reasons. So money can't be explained for those reasons. While the use of money developed in the exchange of products, its historical root is not found there. The institution of Greek money is first and above all connected to a displacement in the exercise of power to a new type of power in which the sovereignty cannot be distinguished from the appropriation it makes to its advantage of the new war machine started by the hoplitic revolution. This is a social revolution as much as a military one since the war machine is no longer in the hands of the nobility, the warrior caste, the knight or the chariot rider surrounded by servants faithful to the heroic ideal 
but the small farmers who became indispensable to the defense of the growing city, hoplites. The collective strength and actions of the people who start to call themselves demos are incarnated in the military formation open to the greatest number and for which the tactics are based on combat and phalanxes with a tight line of soldiers with lance and buckler, man standing to man and actually hooked into each other's equipment. That's the way like hoplites, you know? Yeah. Um, so yet the principle of the phalanx and its system of weaponry, the same for all, implies a reciprocity of service and help, the synchronization of movements and the spontaneous regulation of the whole in a common order accepted by each and performed by all. Nobody in a phalanx cannot be down with what's going on in the phalanx for a phalanx to work, right? right. Um, okay, uh, uh, so much so that the armed force of the hoplites was characterized by the rise in egalitarian demand by citizen soldiers always threatening to turn against those who would use it to maintain class power. This expression indicates how contemporary this question is when merged with the general history of revolution, starting with the struggle between the poor uh, and the rich, always at war in the city polis. The response to this question, genealogically requalified as the primitive scene of politics, is what Foucault points to as a new form of power in his first return to the Greeks, one that is connected to the institution of money. So, and this is where they, they say like it's used. So folk, Foucault therefore begins by studying the major political upheavals in the sixth and seventh centuries, paying particular attention to the hoplitic strategy. Uh, this is the case of, uh, of Corinth uh, where the polymarch uh, Sipsilis, I guess, uh, was brought to power by those who had been his soldiers in an army of hoplites. What interests Foucault the most, however, is the way Sipsilis, uh, I'm actually saying that wrong, aimed to stay in power by introducing the use of money in a political apparatus of economic integration of military power for which the key is to limit social demands, which the formation of hoplite armies make more dangerous in the context of agrarian crises, worsening the debt of peasants. So knowing he has to maintain the regime of property and power held by the possessing class, what does the tyrant do? He Im implements only a partial redistribution to the soldier peasants without forgiving their debt while imposing an income tax of 10% on the fortune of the rich. One part is directly redistributed to the poor. Another finances major work projects and advanced payments to craftspeople. The constitution of this complex system could not be paid in kind. The economic cycle bringing the money distributed to the poor into the coffers of the rich by indemnity for the redistributed land and salaried work who could then pay the tax in money ensures according to the demonstration by Edward Bill uh, to which Foucault refers a circulation or rotation of money and an equivalency with goods and servants services. Money is confirmed as the standard of exchange and equivalences, which imply a first political institution of the state in order of the city by expanding and intensifying the regime of debt, tax, deduction, concurrence, defining value, displacement of the commercial activity of agriculture towards commerce and development of colonization create the formal conditions of a market and produce this market space as immediately controlled by the state, state apparatus. And then just this sentence, created ex nihilo or almost, money appears as dependent on a new and extraordinary form of political power, that of a tyrant or legislator who intervenes in the regimes of property in the play of debt and acquittal and ensures the territorial institutionalization, the re-territorialization of the war machine. Okay, I'm just gonna add to this to maybe uh, clarify just uh, in the next paragraph, just for a second, vis-a-vis Alias and Lazarato. Money is therefore, this is the paragraph top of 39, not as a simple economic capital, you know? So we have to give up that, that kind of association, if you will, right? As seen in its market origins. In the hands of the state, quote unquote, which institutes its use and that it contributes to instituting in turn. Money has less a function of redistribution than that of expanded reproduction of positions of power in society, right? Very interesting, right, in this regard. Such that money is the continuation of civil war by other means, more political means that in search for all the truth of what one owes into the play of power, right? and what it's worth, it is worth. On the one hand, it produces and reproduces while displacing them, the divisions, that is aristocrat, the aristocratic class. And you know, this is also a reading, I, I just wanna mention of um, Nietzsche's genealogy of morals and the distinction between noble and base, you know, and uh, the good and the bad, 
the good and evil that he distinguishes in the first and second chapters of that book and the beginning and the origins of what he calls slave morality in, in the genealogy. So that, that, could, that could be in the margins of this. I mean, you know, bear, bear with me anyway. The, the, yeah, and salaried worker today, right? And, and, and again, salaried worker, the salaried masses, you know, uh, Siegfried uh, Krakauer, you know, actually uh, Adorno's uh, mentor, teacher of Kant, uh, and, you know, from, from Caligari to Hitler, uh, also wrote on this, the salaried masses how this came about. So this is interesting, that feed the always present possibility. And again, they're always looking at the possibility of civil war as the social reality that politics must learn to handle. Okay, so I wanna leave it at that. Remember, if you remember the, the notion stasis in Greek means civil war. You know, what we say is something is in stasis really means it's in civil war. That's the Greek term strife and civil war. So he is, the, I mean, they're both looking at this very actively. So money is not what we would think of it is as, as, as only quote, an economic capital here, right? It's a political power as well. So think of it as political power as well, how, how that's working. So think about it this way. Well, how, are, how are philanthropic organizations founded? I mean, why is it that the Carnegie, the Ford, the Rockefeller, on ad infinitum of, of, of very wealthy classes of people form foundations and it's called philanthropy, right? In a way, you know, friend demand, right? Of course, it's a way of concentrating power, right? And having power over what is thought and what is done. And, you know, there's never been a good, uh, the, to my mind, the, not that I know of a really good good book that analyzes this. I mean, there, there are hints at it and there's some good things, but how this becomes very much part, as much a part, just like Wall Street investments and going back to SPACs, uh, Georgia, SPACs are special project, I think acquisition uh, companies or projects, something like that, that came up of uh, venture capital out of Silicon Valley. So a SPAC is something like digital term Turbine, which is now listed on the stock exchange, where an enormous amount of money is put into something, but they don't make money. It's an idea only in the beginning, right? And there's a whole market around these kind of things. But anyway, that's another level of abstraction. So, so let, let, let me just go back to this. So, so in 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 many ways, um, you know, what what they're really trying to do here is say that you know. This, this wasn't just about exchange, right? <laughs> this was not about just the difference between use value and exchange, but it was a political power. You know, just think about how many, what I just mentioned earlier, the Democrats wanna put money in below, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna fund, you know, these people that spend more money, you know, to our, for, our, for our friends at Target by eliminating part of student debt. Right, they'll take that ten thousand, you know, and go spend it as consumers. Right, in a sense. So they're they're thinking this way in terms of the the public debt back to you know how how this will be used in the in the system. Whereas the Republicans want to control it from above once again. Right, not not put it out. But in the redistribution process, always there is still a political power that's being retained and maybe even more subtly by the liberal class, if you will, right? If you wanna look at this, you know, the middle liberal, moderate liberal class. And I'm not so sure that the left uh, liberal class is, uh, you know, free of this guilt too, but, to, you know, to control, to discipline in a certain way, in a very subtle and, a, and, a, and an interesting, you know, way of doing it. I mean, remember in the United States, for example, let's look at this public, uh, public uh, use of, of, of debt and et cetera. If you still work and you're getting Medicare and Medicaid or, or, and, and, or um, you're also receiving social security, you're taxed as an employed person still, you're still paying into the system, right? And then you're actually taxed on the money outside. So you pay a FICA tax on your, on your pay stubs, right? Even though you may be receiving the money and then you're taxed on that money you received. So you're doubly taxed. You're taxed while you still work to put into the system. And then you're taxed when you take it out. 
It's very interesting, you know, when you begin to think about these mechanisms that are going on, you know, uh, at these times, and you know how how these approaches, you know, go well beyond the usual. More, you know, again, one thing I like about this attempt here, and especially in Anti Oedipus and Aliez and Lazzarato, there's no morality here. It's not that it's an evil system. It is a system, <laughs> you know, we're really looking at this. So, you know, again, and so the war machine is the thing that is creating these conditions, right? You know, it's the warrior class that creates it. No accident to me that the guardians in Plato's Republic are, 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 are warriors. This is a warrior class. You know, these, these are warriors being formed. You read carefully, you know, and some of us read by Jew together, the re reworking of the, uh, of the uh, of the republic, uh, you know, you look at the, the 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 time that is spent on the gymnasia, on the physical characteristics to build the warrior in this republic. And remember, this is three hundred years later than what Foucault is referring to. Yeah, so he's really looking, David. I mean, I, you know, and we'll go back to your question because it's I mean it's complicated. I don't know if I have an answer. To, you know, where, where where you're going. But the, the Solon, in a way, he's really looking at the reformists, the beginning of democracy, if you will, the demos, right? <laughs> you know, Solon in the beginning of, of democracy, you know? And uh, this, is, this is where they're going. This is their, their kind of origin here. You know, how does Solon come up with this framework, right, of reallotment, if you will, redistribution, right? And does this redistribution not favor ultimately the tyrant or whatever, you know, the democracy itself was a kind of myth, you know, by the people, right, in, in some ways. It was an advance in terms of economic well-being, you know, et cetera, maybe some voice, but still it fed the tyrant. It still felt, felt you know, and I like to call, I mean, the United States is, you know, the oligarchic uh, democracy, you know, a kind of in, in, inverted democracy, you know, the oligarchy rules. And of course, you have the myth of the vote, the myth of a choice, you know, all these kind of things that are really working, working out at, at this point. But go oh, ahead, David, I, please. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, it's great. It, it just, it strikes me that um, uh, in terms of, of like debt and debt relief, first of all, the, the move that they're making to say that money starts as a way to, to instantiate power, just forget about markets for a moment. It's, it's about exactly. power. Yeah. And then, like, then, yeah. exactly, to then see the use of money in our moment generally as immediately for power, and then in in like for commerce in a secondary kind of a way. I mean, I think is is really really fascinating. It opens up like right. a lot of questions and a lot of possibilities um, uh, through that view. Um, uh, so so and, one way of approaching this, given the Ukrainian war, excuse me, just for, you know, just for a second, um, you know, one way of approaching this kind of thinking would be to take a look at what is the Ukrainian debt now to NATO and the US? Why are these people's talking about, a, a quote, another infinite war? What is at stake here? You know, th this, this to me is a very real question. Of course, none of us like to see the suffering, the displaced people, all of this, of course not. But this, this is really part of financialization going on right now. You know, I mean, Putin is secondary. Russia phobia is secondary. It's part of financialization. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you really want to look at this in terms of financialization and wars, right? Yeah. yeah. In, in many ways. But please yeah. go ahead. David. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, there's uh, I'm just along example. those lines. Um, uh, I happen to hear uh, David Harvey did a, a, a critique of the idea um, that this is really about a geopolitical attempt to control Central Asia, uh, Central, you know, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and the reason that that sort of falls apart, I mean, the, the question is, for what, right? Like, if like the the battle over this strip of land, over this geography, I agree, Mike. Like, the question is still like, for what are we battling over that? What are we trying to do with it? And to make it as liquid as possible, I think is is one of those like kinds of things to make it as financialized. Yeah, it's, it's a black gold and and uh, you know paper money right together. I mean, you know, and we're, money. yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, we're I mean, dumping military equipment into the ocean in order to respond to our our crises. Essentially, thirty billion dollars. The vast majority of the aid we've pledged is aid pledged to Lockheed Martin and Raytheon. It's not going to Ukraine. It's going to, to our weapons manufacturers and the weapons go over. Our, our, uh, our uh, Secretary of Defense's middle name, Lloyd Raytheon Austin. Huh? Exactly. 
So, um, so all of that is, is really fascinating. And debt relief, this is just what I was going to mention, is yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, the way um, that debt relief, that the fight for debt relief on the progressive side, right, that the, the, the majority, not everybody, not all of the organizations, like the debt collective, depending on like, there are different personalities within that group and whatever. Um, but most of certainly the progressive, quote unquote, and liberal uh, uh, re moves toward debt relief are still like requests, right? Like it's a request of somebody to please relieve this debt. And if we are requesting that someone please relieve our debt, then we are legitimating the debt itself, right? We're, we're saying that you have the right to decide whether or not I have to pay this debt. Right. And so if we fight, for debt relief by asking someone to please relieve our debt, then we are trapped very much in the uh, in in what Lazarado and Elias and Lazarado points to in, in another book as like the originary moment of this, right? Like we're not fighting to get out of this if if we say please you boss who's in charge of this debt relieve some of this debt for me. Right. We are very much in this in this logic and it's very comfortable for the system that that we have a problem with supposedly. Why why a Michael Hudson? Uh, Richard Deanst, our friend from Rutgers, the bonds of debt, Michael Hudson, you know, who announced and wants a debt jubilee. And this is in the, uh, the Old Testament. You know, this is in the Old Testament, the debt jubilee. So, you know, you have a very long history of this that you could really work with in terms of the erasure of debt. And what is the Russian, Re the Bolshevik revolution basically does, right? It takes away indebtedness. I mean, this is what revolution does. You know, the, the, the notion of the conscience Right? In a way, this is why revolution is so scary to so many people. You know, it eliminates that, you know, indebtedness, you know, that, 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 that um, Schuld, right, in, in the German, that Heidegger is very good at, that Freud is very good in terms of the formation of the superego. Debt and guilt are very much connected here, right? And this is, this is again, very, very important to, to consider for, here. For, yeah. our, for our moment, inflation, also addresses debt, yeah. right? Like yeah. inflation is one of the ways to get rid of massive amounts of debt, especially for regular people, but our wages have to go up, right? Because our, our debt will stay well, essentially the yeah. same if our wages go up. So like, so how do you, how does the Fed, how does this group respond right. to inflation by disciplining the workforce, right? But by making life harder for the workforce, not by giving us the opportunity to use inflation to get out of debt, but by disciplining us and yeah. Fascinating. Well, so as you know, I mean, there is an upsurge. I mean, I'm not, I'm not overly optimistic. I'm very cautious in terms of the approach, but this upsurge of union activity and young people becoming more interested in this. You saw the New York Times, probably a lot of you this past uh, weekend of this woman who's a Broad scholar who's organizing at Starbucks. So what are they gonna do? They're gonna discipline the working class. To make sure that this goes nowhere. I mean, this is this is in the cards, very very actively, right? W once again, right? So yeah. And Michael, and, I would you'll you'll I think enjoy this. Like there's through at least two mechanisms, right? Like yes. one of the the mechanisms of capture of the upsurge of wildcat activity that the last that we've seen in the last two or three years right. is a massive investment in organizing by the Teamsters and by AFT and by the giant unions who definitely don't want this wildcatting going on and don't want independent labor organizations to be sprouting up. So the, the Teamsters are fighting tooth and nail to get into Amazon to make sure that, that's, that Amazon becomes a Teamster shop, right? Like, is that, is that the beginning or is that the end? That's you know, the end. Like, you Just know. like the NLRB was the end, even though we, we thought it was good at the time, it was really the end. 1935 marked the end of militant labor. No, there were signs, obviously. I'm not saying that there weren't, you know, Drum in Detroit. There were many, many militant, and I'm sure people have family members who, you know, in this, in this, uh, in this uh, session have uh, people in their, in their history who, who, who fought on the shop floor or did things. But, but, you know, on the other hand, yes. I mean, since the, the uh, Wildcats sit down and the sit down strikes and the old violent strikes in a way, very few uh, uh, moments in labor history that you know, after the NLRB, the NLRB was the disciplining function that came in. 
And then, of course, you know, the Wagner Act and, you know, you know, the history of labor here. And then you you can stack the, the NLRB with, uh, you know, Republicans or Democrats at a certain time and, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a very, very crucial moment to really think about. And I mean, this is where like an Aronowitz on terms of, I mean, you know, again, I'm, you know, sorry to, you know, <laughs> yeah, anyway, but I mean, you know, he was very smart on this stuff. You know, uh, that collective bargaining really was the death of labor unions. You don't sign contracts. You don't need the contract unionism is the death. It turns into collective begging and it turns into, you know, basically complete co class of, you know, compromise. Of course, everybody's going to argue, oh, we never would have had pension. We never would have had all these good working hours and all these little advances. Yes, maybe. <laughs> but on the other hand, what would we have had as a culture and the fear and really a distinctive culture if we had not gone that way, you know, in a, in a way. And, you know, it's no accident that labor unions have declined in membership. And when the AFT, uh, the FLCIO, this woman who's now the, you know, the, the head of it, comes out and says they want to build a million new members, that's nothing over 10 years. Nothing. I mean, just think about how paltry that really is as a target, you know? <laughs> And whereas and capitalism is talking about, you know, the semiconductor industry, we want to grow by 300% in the next, uh, you know, two years. She wants to grow her forces by 10% over 10 years. This is ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, this is the thinking that it's led to. And again, go back to Althusser, the history of the question, right? How did we get here? <laughs> how did we, how are we not questioning this? So I, I think you're, yeah. You're on to something. And I think it's excellent to see this, this question of money outside as a suspension of the economic and expect, you know, a, 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 a um, suspension of market forces, forces of supply and demand, the suspension of exchange, and seeing it as political power. This is really what's go well, it's going down. And, you know, if you read this history from Solon, I mean, by the way, there's a, I think I mentioned this last week, a very good book, From Solon to Socrates, by Victor Ehrenberg, an English Marxist, uh, which, which takes into account a lot of this. They didn't cite him. They should have. But, you know, the, like I said, the French are, you know, they have a lot of internal. But Victor Ehrenberg is his name. From Solon to Socrates is the name of the book, right? Yeah. So, and very interesting how they, they investigate this. You know, and yeah. So, um, uh, and, and again, I, I want to point this out. You know, Engels, Engels was, you know, very interested in military history and wrote on it and wrote on force in history too. And uh, this is very important to remember that the Marxist tradition, very few people have gone into this. You know, it's anti-war movements and all this kind of stuff. But the study of war itself, wars and capital, wars and revolution, you know, and, and capital and revolution, very not, very not, not seen so much, right? You know, and too many explanatory models rather than going back again to this notion of deterritorialization. What they're really saying here is money is invented as a deterritorialized signifier, right? <laughs> it's, you know, it's not, it is the ultimate deterritorialization, right? In a sense, it's not only the universal equivalent, right? Or as Marx called it, the universal whore, right? In a sense. But it is this kind of ultimate deterritorialization that's going on, you know, this extremely high level of abstraction, right? That is basically political, right? In terms of its thing. Because polos itself, the political, it, it really means that polemic, that pole on which we're, we're, you know, standing, where the power is, you know, and they, and they go through this too very well later in the, in the text. I'm really glad you brought this up because this opens up, you know, the Nietzschean moment, the will to power and what power means, you know, going back to Junger and of course uh, the difference between poussin and poussance and pouvoir in French, right? And, and you, know, uh, uh, you know, how this, how this plays out in their work as well. So yeah, very, very good, yeah, yeah, yeah. So David, some other things. I mean, we can we can still go on with this too. The economy becomes political through the power that combines war and money. So this is very important at the bottom of page uh, thirty-nine to play on your work there. We can see immediately a critical purpose for Foucault in relation to the Marxist economism. So remember, there's an argument here against 
the Marxist political economist, right, that combines the functions of the state power and more in the follow, follow determination of the economic infrastructure. So, and then he, go, then he goes on, right, right, uh, from the new alliance that money, nomisma, right, nomisma is the Greek word for money, concluded by warding off civil war under a form that is still tyranny, the nomos, that is the law that all have to share, right? <laughs> this is insolvent, emerges as a juridical political structure of the city state. It's based on share, sharing, allotment, very, very crucial. No accident that the Platonic dialogue, the Cratylus has a section on the casting of lots, the playing of the game of lots gambling early on and allotment. Very interesting that the, the first early dialogues of Plato engaged it. 20 years later in Athens, and this is interesting, you go to the, from the, you know, to the city state, right? Where the poor are sent into slavery due to their debts and property owners are pursued by violence to the heart of their household. Good government, good assert themselves as the good and regular distribution of power in an opposite and complementary way to the operation of Sipselis. Uh, uh, the eunomia instituted by Solon was a way of substituting, this is important, a distribution of political power for the distribution of wealth demanded. Where land was demanded, power was given, right? Very interesting, right? Power is a substitute for wealth in the operation of eunomia, right? Solon, on the other hand, unlike Sipselis, shared our power up to a point so as to not to have to redistribute wealth. Yeah. So this is very interesting, you know, what he's going on. What is Solon's reform, next paragraph, if not the distribution of political power in function of the economic distribution of wealth, the four poll tax clauses, classes, right? which is hidden by including all citizens, even the poorest in the new system where power takes a democratic form. Power is no longer what is exclusively by the few and power is what is exercised permanently through all the citizens. Sound familiar, right? <laughs> yeah, get out the vote, right? In a permanent political warding off of civil war, taking the form of power sharing instead of wealth sharing, right? Very interesting, huh? It is therefore necessary that they obey a different order and mechanisms following a break such that if one seizes too much power, one is punished by the city. If one seizes too much wealth, one can expect the, the punishment from you know, thunder and lightning from Zeus, right? Since it is chance, luck, fate, or the gods that determine the poverty and wealth of each in the limits of what could prevent their participation in the assembly of citizens. Under Solon's guidance, and, and you know, we forget this in terms of the origins of democracy, right? The democratic good legislation of eunomia is able to substitute the abolition of death slavery and the concurrent operation of adjusting the value of money in favor of debtors. This is interesting, adjusting the value of money in favor of debtors for the total elimination of debts and the general redistribution of land isonomia, the division in equal parts, demanded by the greatest number, the poli. Money is deployed there as the simulacrum of power shared out among everyone, while it ensures at the cost of a certain economic sacrifice, the preservation of power in the hands of some. In Athenian hands, the tetra, tetra drachma, stamped with the owl, and uh, evocations of Hegel here. Right? May the mere simulacra of power held elsewhere shine for a moment. The olive of Minerva takes light at dusk, right? Which by right, that of the nomos belongs in common to all. All being unequally encouraged for the sake of eunomia, but at the rank occupied by each person to develop craft work, commerce, towards exportation and colonies. You want to talk about how innovative economies are talked about, right? Um, you know, um, um, entrepreneurial capital, right? Th this is very interesting in the sense of getting this kind of, you know, this, the, the basically the psychic origins as well. Where does this stuff come from? I'm going to go into business. I'm going to open a shop. I'm going to start a new venture, etc. This certainly alters the very conception of war, cutting it off from the hoplitic 
civic model while at the same time turning towards the sea, control of islands and maritime routes, priority given to the fleet, financed by the state, and siege warfare, development of polo, uh, polo-recratics, um, excuse me, politocratics, military techniques, and mercenaries. Starting with the Peloponnesian War, and again, Marx's favorite history, history of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides. Right? Athenian imperialism is accompanied by the professionalization of the army in a permanent war using every means available. Battles became more costly with the spirit of conflict yielding to the desire to annihilate while hand-to-hand -hand war of commandos and guerrillas started to compete with battles. Yet internal war also retu returns constantly in the cycle of division of power and the distribution of good with the monetary chromastics denounced by Aristotle because it only seeks the acquisition of money itself and consequently in an unlimited quantities. It explodes the principle of measure of neither too much nor too little, excess wealth and excess poverty. And we can go here with prosperity and scarcity. This was a good opening, the return to scarcity, David, that you may talked about, that held the Solonian split between politics and economy, which can be clearly seen as a fiction destined to displace an otherwise real rupture between rich and poor, right? It's where it starts, right? The democratic, right, in a sense, right? Yet the function of warding off the Solian neither too much nor too little must be measured in relation to a capitalization that threatens to provoke a manner of proto-capitalism, manufacturing, commercial, and military. The monetarization of the economy that made it possible to ward off civil war places the polis and its institutions under mortal danger because the unlimited appropriations and accumulation that money contains and frees with its effects of immediate economic capture always risks intensifying excess wealth, wealth and excess poverty. And we're, we're witnessing that today, right? We, we're seeing this constantly. This power of money must be warded off through a set of codifications that impose political, religious, moral, and social limits on its power of deterritorialization, right? So this is very, very, very interesting the way they're doing here, you know, and then, he, they, then they go into this very good analysis. And I know David Salvage likes this. This is a concrete example of the New Deal on the next page. They have a really good example of this at work. This explains how the Foucaultian description of the institution of money can be taken up in a parallel made by Deleuze and Guattari with the policies of the New Deal. As if the Greeks had discovered in their own way what the Americans rediscovered after the New Deal, that heavy taxes are good for business. Very interesting, right? Because taxation monetarizes the economy. By giving the state a power of abstraction and penetration that gives it the means of both economic and political redistribution while preserving class power, right? Preserving class power. This is the issue of the New Deal, which had to breathe new life into the same operation in a critical situation where capitalism, in order to survive, had to contradict its tendency towards absolute deterritorialization of flows of exchange and production by inventing the unprecedented and oh so temporary, right? Again, oh so temporary figure of a reformism of capital, right? Yeah, and you know, Deleuze and Guattari, they're funny because at times they, they cite uh, Peter Townsend and the who, you know, maybe a new boss, same as the old boss, we won't get fooled again. This was their version of the New Deal, right? So, you know, I mean, very, very interesting that they do this in, in, in uh, anti Oedipus. This is what reformism leads to. The new boss, same as the old boss, right? In many ways, it's still reformism. So we must re re represent, you know, remember. And again, this is the passage, and I, I like the way this is done. To me, this is the way you displace traditional narrative and you think it through, you know, narrative conceptually in a way. You're going back to Corinth. You're going back to Solon and into the present age, right? In many ways, that the passage through Corinth was aimed more generally at establishing the relationship. David, I think he's summing up here the, the economic cycle, war and army, the appropriation of the war machine by the state 
consists less of its transformation into a professional army than in its integration into the circuit of production, taxation, technological innovation, science, and employment, right? And, you know, we could, we could think of this, one of the, the things that happened post-Vietnam was the militarization of everyday life, you know? Uh, really the militarization of everyday life. You know, it's amazing how many kids today, and as this has gone on in 20 years in my teaching, you know, at a working class institution, if you will, yes, sir, right, to the professor. I never said this in my life, yes, sir. You know, I got kicked out of reserve officers training, uh, you know, but anyway, uh, you know, and accused of all kinds of things that I, you know, didn't do, but anyway. <laughs> but, but anyway, yes, sir, this is part of this militarization of everyday life, you know, the way people speak. Things are calculated this way. It's very interesting to see this, this breakdown between military and civil, right? In many, many ways. This is a very, very interesting, you know, rupture that took place to my mind in the 1980s, you know? And uh, this, this, this leads us to another, you know, uh, you know, if you will, retrospective reading because he goes through how Reagan, you know, Reagan basically, by the way, was, you know, he, he, in the beginning, he was a, a, a labor organizer. You know, when he was with Jane Wyman, he was an okay guy, you know, in the beginning. But then he turned, right? <laughs> and, you know, he was, he was taken in by General Electric. He became the General Electric uh, uh, slogan. And I think I wrote down somewhere what he said, you know, to, uh, you know, the guy that helped uh, form him. They, they mentioned him here uh, in the, uh, the long footnote on his mentor. So, but it's interesting how this works, you know, that this return of the 50s, but with a military militarization, you know, it's no longer, yeah, yeah. And, and, and how this professional militarization, you know, Rangel was smart, Charles Rangel in Harlem as a representative, because he, he understood that if you get rid of the draft, you lose a peace movement, right? <laughs> if you make the military voluntary and look, look what happened, you know, during this past years, you know, yeah, you have basically a professional military, you know, there's no real peace movement out there, you know, in a, in a sense, you know, I mean, yeah. So very, very, very interesting uh, how this uh, went on. I'm trying to find the passage on, on Reagan. I think I, uh, I, I wrote it down uh, in the back here. Um, yeah, anyway. Uh, yeah, his name was uh, Lemuel uh, um, Bulwer. Salvation is not free, was the name of his piece about a uh, thing. Uh, Reagan sent him a set of autograph, autograph golf balls when he got to the White House. You know, dear, dear Lem, in case I do something wrong, hit one of these, um, you know, uh, with a nine iron or a wedge, and I'll feel it. So this was Reagan's uh, mentor and handler in the beginning, right? Right. So this was the revival of laissez-faire economics and, of course, Reaganomics, which Reagan, you know, didn't forge at all. He was told to do it and, you know, he acted it out for them. You know, the, the great PR, you know? Yeah, yeah. In, in many ways. And this is General Electric, you know, and remember those of you that follow Wall Street, General Electric was the model corporation of its time because of Jack Welch putting things together, you know, back in the day, uh, you know, uh, anyway. Um, Michael. Yeah. yeah. There's a, just something uh, I'll mention very quickly, something interesting here. They mentioned communication. Um, yeah. You just mentioned Reagan as like a, as a public relations person, um, primarily. Um, and I like I just wonder going forward, uh, like there's um, Stratcom is the other thing that I'm kind of uh, uh, focused on um, and the relationship between the dominance of like the militarization of everyday life and the Stratcoming of communication of all kinds of communication, right? Of, of like, like the, um, I'll say it this way, that the, the almost universalization of good public relations as a criteria to consider somebody a good communicator in any sphere of life. Seems to me to have occurred over the same stretch of time that the militarization of everyday life did. Yes, I agree, yeah. And so like Sorry. that strat calming and militarization, I'm just, I don't have like a section in here to point oh, you. No, no, I understand. They do I, talk I, about I, communication. A little later in the book, but anyway, as we get to section 10 and 11, they'll, they'll go there. Uh, let, let me just mention this. First of all, I have a niece who is in a strategic uh, strat com 
program at King's College in, in London. So there, there are things like this. Guess who the sponsors are? Of course, the Atlantic Alliance, the Atlantic Council, and NATO, right? So this, this is what's going on, and we see this at work every day. Luckily, she's coming to Greece where we can decode or debrief her, you know, for the, for the summer, <laughs> for, six, for two weeks, you know. Anyway, she's very open-minded. It's good, you know, and they already know what I'm, what I'm about, so the parents are not upset. <laughs> she's, she's coming. So anyway, uh, on, on, on the other hand, yes. Uh, but this, this, this uh, actually, as you know, goes back to, of course, Bernays and others. But there's so many figures that are forgotten in here that worked in the corporation that took their cue from Bernays, but even were much more sophisticated, right? Much more sophisticated. In, in the, and remember Maslow, for example, these, what, whatever it was called is, uh, you know, this hierarchy of needs and all this kind of stuff. He, he originally was a communist. I mean, he was originally a very left, left, left all the way, and then became basically a sponsor of business, right, in, in a sense. And you have a lot of people like this in the history of the U.S. So, you know, when we say they're just stupid, that's not really, really true, uh, you know, that they're that stupid. They're always thinking of ways to get 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 us, you know, back in line, right? In, in a sense, this, you know, very very important to, to think this through, you know. And there are all kinds of strategies that are involved, et cetera. I mean, I have friends, you know, I'm not pro Putin, but I'm not pro Ukraine, you know. And, and I have friends that won't talk to me because I tell them that the, you know, why are we fighting the second most powerful army in the world right now? Why, why are we wasting all this uh, money on this, et cetera? And why can't we just divide up the place and, and get be done with it and get on to more serious stuff, you know, and what this is really about. But, you know, people, the, the, Putin's evil, he's a demon, et cetera. If you listen to his speech, he's 10 times more intelligent than, you know, a dumb Blinken and dumber uh, Sullivan, right? Than yawning, yelling. I have named nicknames for him all now. You know, yeah, right. Yeah. You're not only Sleepy Joe. I can't wait till I get a phone call from Trump. Uh, anyway, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, you know, and uh, I won't. I won't go to my ones on Powell, you know, Jerome Powell, and the uh, Fed, Federal Reserve. But but anyway, um, all to say, I mean, very very important to remember. There's a whole history of figures. You know, Steve and I just put in the chat the uh, Jack Welch. The biography of this guy, you know, this was part of an 80s culture that came up, you know, and really displaced almost everybody in this Tina syndrome, right? Because the Tina syndrome is, is still with us so actively. Nobody is questioning. That's why this Althusserian move they're talking about is very important. This dehistorization, this ahistorical approach to everything is, 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 is very frightening. Yeah, in many ways. So um, anyway, yeah, we'll get into all this, you know, because they, they go there later in the book. What they want to do, let me just let me just read another passage. Um, you know, army and, and war, and this is at the bottom of, of 43, and this announces the project in a different way, um, are parts of the political organization of power. And remember, they're really looking, you can retitle this book, capital as power, you know, capital and war, right, and wars, right? I mean, in some ways, right? So, and the economic circuit of capital, and we will describe their different functions throughout this book, the economy as the war policy of capital. This is interesting, a different thing. The economy as the war policy, right? Not just the war policy in Ukraine or in, you know, back in the Southeast Asia, Afghanistan, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, uh, yeah, but as the war policy of capital, money and capital remain empty economic abstractions without the flow of power, right? War and civil war constitute the most deterritorialized modalities of this flow. The market economy is not autonomous. It has no possibility of independent ex existence outside the power of these flows. So again, they're going through this, you know, Deleuzian, Guattarian language of flows, right, and relays throughout, right? The economic functions of money, and this is interesting, you know, Marx has many levels of what money is, right, in, in, in capital, and especially in the first 
you know, the, the Grundrisse, as you all know, are seven notebooks that he composed in feverish uh, activity in about six months, <laughs> in 1857 till 1858. And, you know, and, the, and these were bequeathed to us and then, you know, written about, and, you know, discovered, kept in the Soviet Union, and then released in, in, in many languages. And uh, again, the economic functions of money as measure, as accumulation, general equivalent, means of payment depend on a flow of destruction slash creation that refers to something completely other than the, um, the Arenic Schumperian definition of the entrepreneur's activity. If money is not supported by a flow of strategic power that finds its absolute form in war, it loses its value in capital. Right? And if you want to look at technology, I mean, why does Microsoft remain so profitable? Why do, why do these companies do so well, right? <laughs> you know, in a sense, the Apples, the, the Microsofts, right? Think, think about this, the semiconductor industry. Why is the head of Intel, you know, at the uh, State of the Union address and cited at that point? Very important of, you know, the quote, war capital as the policy of the war economy. The war economy, right? So the expropriation, right? And then he goes, uh, if money is not supported, it loses its value uh, as capital. If it's not supported, form in war. So really, in a way, in order to have capitalism is predicated on war, right? Throughout, and and it's also predicated on war in terms of political power throughout, right? We can go back to the hoplitic. And, you know, I know I mentioned earlier on with Deleuze and Guattari, the work of, uh, of um, Georges Dumizel, you know, Mithma uh, Varunda, you know, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, very good work he did on the Indo-European uh, uh, splits in, in war, in the warrior class. Right. Anyway, the expropriation of the means of production and the appropriation of the means of exercise in force, that is the war machine. So you have, you know, force and means of production together are the conditions of formation of capital and constitution of the state that develop in parallel. So again, capital's accumulation and monopoly on force and the state's accumulation and monopoly on force sustain each other reciprocally. Without war being waged externally, colonial and interstate war, and without the state waging civil war and internal wars of subjectivities. And this is a very important part of this book, by the way, I think, wars on subjectivity. The war against women, right? The war against minorities, the war against subjectivities. It's not only the war against the poor, not only the war against, you know, middle classes, you know, class warfare, gender warfare, race warfare, this is always, always already going on, right? Capital would have never been formed, right? Without this war on subjectivity, right? You know, remember, you know, Luther is working during the time when modern subjectivity, if you will, that orientation according to Heidegger begins with Luther, you know, and it, this is the peasant rebellion in Germany that he's responding with and to in the thesis on Wittenberg. So anyway, inversely, without capture and the valorization of wealth oper operated by capital, the state would never have been able to exercise, exercise its sovereign function, all of which are based on the organization of an army, right? In a way, all right? So the logic of capital, and I, I like this very much, the logic of capital is a logic of infinite valorization that employs, I mean, excuse me, implies and employs, employs the accumulation of forces and therefore an accu continued accumulation of a power that is not only economic, but strategic, not only communication, uh, David, power over and knowledge of the strength and weaknesses of the classes fighting. And if we could keep this in mind, class struggle then becomes much more you know, thoughtful much more, you know, appropriate to think through in a very different way, because they're always looking at strength and weaknesses of the classes fighting, right? Very, very important, you know, to look at that as we're going forward, you know, strong power, weak power. Yeah, many ways, yeah, very, very, very important. So the next section begins capitalism as a world economy, right? 
and this is this is it. It's not American capitalism, American imperialism. It's capital as a um, as a world economy, right? Always, always, already. You know, even though you know Macron, Boris Johnson, all these clowns are you know sycophants of the U.S. Uh, you know empire, if you will, or U.S. hegemony. It's still capital as a system to which they're all faithful to in the world economy. So very, very important. And I like the way they go back to 1492, you know, too, in, in, in terms of the, the beginnings of what happened with capital. And, and, and the, first, the first moment after that is, of course, the war against women. And one of the two, two major participants here in terms of theory are Silvi, um, you know, um, um, uh, Federici, Silvia Federici, and, uh, um, and, her, and, her, and uh, Maria uh, Mies, right? Very, very important, right, right, right. And this is very interesting. Uh, you know, the uh, um, with Maria Mai Silver Federici can risk a parallel between the unpaid work of reproduction performed by women, paired with the appropriation of their profits by male workers and the forced labor of slaves. She studies the way in which the war against women aimed at disciplining them as part of the framework of a new type of patriarchy. And this is interesting, the salaried patriarchy. Very, very important to keep this in mind, right? And, uh, and then which, witches were, you know, uh, you know uh, the Middle Ages is not um, uh, a history of mentalities, but the Sabbath of capital, the witch hunts, right? Kind of interesting, the Sabbath of capital, very nice metaphor that I, that I uh, kind of go to. So we, we can go into this now too, because they're gonna go into now uh, you know, the second moment, if you will, of originary accumulation, that moment now is about the war against subjectivity, right? And, and the beginning of the biopolitics. Unless you want to stay with money again. I mean, the, 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 the first chapter is really to try to develop this, this triad again of state war machine and war machine and money and always thinking through the war machine. And I'm really glad we read, and maybe we can go back to it uh, later in the summer, the Deleuze and Guattari nomadology on the war machine, because I think it's very dense and very important for an understanding of this book. So we're, maybe we should do you know, some follow-up <laughs> going back there, because they're really trying to look at this Orstadt formation, right? They come out of nowhere, this Nietzschean thing, like, like lightning you know, et cetera, these founders of the Urstadt. Again, they're trying to locate things here, but not as origins, but as springing forth. What is that actual moment? It's a much different than pegging it as a fixed point, right? It is an emergence that's happening, right? And, and, and this, and I think it's a much better way to read than that you've got a fixed origin or a fixed starting point only, right? Yeah, so anyway. Uh, so, David, some other other uh, remarks. I, I know you're, uh, you know, uh, you know, had a lot uh, um, of thoughts about this. Yeah. Uh, tons. Not at the moment, though. I'll, I'll stop. Okay. There. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. No. No. I mean, anybody else? I mean, you know, the second part is really about subjectivity. It's a very, very interesting thing about the wars against subjectivity. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, you know, hey, David, so. please define what you meant by spec. No, I, I've said back. I, I did that, George. I told you. It's a special projects acquisition companies. It's part of venture capital activity that happened in Silicon Valley to finance new projects that make no money, have no sign of, of the horizon of any closer than five to 10 years of ever having a product. But yeah, but there there's billions of dollars that have gone into these, right? Very much like credit default spots, swaps, but this time there was more of a mater materialization beyond that of paper products, right? Where the, the someone in Beijing held the fourth uh, moment of your mortgage, uh, you know, uh, uh, through many default, uh, uh, you know, or, or credit swaps that are going on on Wall Street in terms of financial uh, architecture. One of so, Michael, one of uh, on the street. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. What, yeah. One of the really interesting and funny things about SPACs. Right. So SPACs, like they're a way to bring a private company public so you can be traded on the stock market without doing an IPO, 
because an IPO requires a great deal more scrutiny than a SPAC does. So it does That's the same thing. You're That's avoiding the SEC regulation to the to the letter. Exactly. Yeah. So this was very hot for two or three years. You've been talking about it a lot, Michael. You're which is a really good, a really good call. What's happened is it reached a point where like the conversations among the financial elite was that like everybody's friend had a SPAC. So like you went out to dinner with your rich friends and they'd be like, oh yeah, we got a SPAC now. You know, you just write yourself a company and then you bring it public through a SPAC right. and you investors okay. and you have a shit ton of money. And that's like, that's it. That's all there is to it. So, so it got that common and that ridiculous. And this year they're all exploding. Like there's been a, a massive wave. No more SPACs are being introduced because nobody will give them money. And the ones that were introduced in the last two or three years are, are cascading out of existence. This is what I mean by deleveraging too. A lot of the a lot of this debacle on Wall Street right now is deleveraging itself too, because they need liquidity after all this is happening too. So the deleveraging is happening, margin calls, all these these kind of moments are, are happening all at once, right? In a sense. So we just read on the surface, the, you know, the New York Times School of Education, right? Oh, it's inflation. It's not really just inflation. It's, it's as usual, a liquidity crisis in the financial architecture and in financialization. And they're sitting up there working. I'm sure David can tell me how many of his uh, patients are insomniac uh, at Goldman Sachs because they're working night and day to figure out new products that they have to put out there to hedge against a complete free fall in this right <laughs> right and I'm, I'm sure it's not the higher ups that are doing this the hank paulson's the lord blankfields etc you know yeah anyway yeah so yeah so uh yes so george i hope that helps you with uh SPACs, right thank yeah. you yes okay yeah yeah okay yeah yeah so yeah it's a way of getting around the sec right that's what the left should do we should have had SPACs, you know, special revolutionary acquisition <laughs> projects, right? <laughs> we, you, know, right. Sure. you know, we can figure out something clever that, you know, has a good, good res resonation with a fetish. Yeah. Anyway. Um, okay. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, the war on subjectivity, I, I found uh, very, very good. I mean, they're, they're recapitulating stuff that most of us have read, but it's very interesting, um, you know, um, um, I mean, I'll, I'll just highlight a few of the things. Uh, page, um, so for example, page uh, 46, capitalism has been a global market from the beginning. For that reason, it can only be analyzed as a war economy. This is the, the middle of, um, of uh, page uh, 46, right? Um, what Marx called primitive accumulation or original accumulation, and this is where the translation issues came up, the Ursprünglicht uh, accumulation and then the, the capital meaning of the first major deterioration, right, initially um, produced by war, conquest, and invasion takes place at the same time in the new world that was just discovered, external colonization, and in Europe, internal colonization. So originary accumulation, I like originary, but anyway, does not create the economic conditions of capitalism and the international division of labor, describing North-South geopolitical division of a world that we still call our own, without establishing, and this is interesting because they're going to go into how subjectivities are things. And so this whole thing about the global South, you have to always think about how the subjectivities have been formed there. What, what, what really made it possible? for say, you know, uh, a member of N19 guerrilla group to be elected possibly to Colombia, the presidency of Colombia. How did this happen, right? And civilizations on which strategies of division, differentiation and inequality are based that span the class composition of the international proletariat. And as a result, by extension and by intention, the classical location starting with a moment between the 15th and 16th centuries, when landed gentry and the nascent bourgeoisie launched a civil war in England against peasant farmers, artisans, and day laborers for the privatization of common lands. The destruction of the community structure of villages and centers of domestic production, the abandon of subsistence crops and the crops and the appropriation of farms, expropriation, reducing populations to misery forcing a growing number, sound like gentrification too. You know, there's always the nascent gentrification 
that's working and that is, you know, gone by the wayside. Uh, you know, a growing number of uprooted into mendicancy men, men, and vagrancy and leaving them no other choice than between extermination and the forced march of disciplinarianization towards wage labor, right? This is how wage labor is created in many ways. You know, and you think about the end of the Civil War, you know, we had this discussion two weeks ago with, with David about, you know, Faulkner and the Civil War as an example of, uh, you know, some of the, the war machine at work. You know, when you begin to think about that, there was a disciplinarian moment after the Civil War, right, that happened, right? And if you, again, if you go back and look at this Craig Wilder book, Ebony and Ivy, you begin to see, you know, what, what was the result of the end of slavery? Well, black bodies were starting to be used as experiments to show an, anatomical lessons by, by doctors, right? They were people, you know, that, that became owned by the institutions, you know, et cetera. And this is not going on in Louisiana or Mississippi. You know, I'm not trying to exonerate Louisiana or, you know, Mississippi. I'm like Dylan, you know, uh, one thing I did wrong is I stayed in Mississippi a day too long. But anyway, but the, the thing is, is that this was more pronounced in a sense in the hypocrisy of, you know, Nassau and Suffolk County in New York and the presence of the Klan, you know, at these elite institutions and how much they were indebted. To, to slavery, how much they used this, how much they capitalized upon it. So this is very important and how wage labor is really created. You know, this is again, an interesting thing. We take it for granted. It's a wage labor capital struggle, but where did wage labor come from? How did it start, right? Simultaneously, the enclosures, right? The concentration of land and merging of tenures throughout Europe, uh, Europe submitted to the bloody legislation that, that Marx analyzed at length and had brought back slavery before generalizing the practice of internment as a structure of forced labor was combined with the appropriation of the masterless lands. You know, there's, this is the way the Americas were constituted, the masterless lands of America. Amazing, huh? The way these people thought, they have no master. Again, I'm always reminded of Werner Herzog's great film, Agira, Wrath of God, where the Indian puts the Bible to his uh, ear and he can't hear anything, he starts shaking the Bible, right? It's a great, great sequence with Klaus Kinski in, in one of the rafts. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. So um, anyway, so conquest, right? Of the pillaging of natural and mineral wealth combined with agricultural exploitation of fallow lands led to a variable genocide right, of uh, indigenous populations. We know this, you know, in a way we, we, you know, we talk it to death, we're not really doing much about it. I mean, still, you know, in many ways. Their boy, you know, and in New York, I mean, you know, this new uh, governor, Kathy Holchel, her husband is, is appropriating Indian, uh, making deals with casino owners, right, at the expense of many of the indigenous people. Oh. And what they're entitled to in lands in New York, uh, in the state of New York. You know, this is not put out there. She's endorsed by the New York Times, of course. You know, <laughs> um, you know, uh, goes without saying. But it would be filled by a slave trade due to the turning of Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins. And again, they're quoting people that are writing about this during that time, signaling the dawn of the era of capitalist production. These idyllic proceedings are the chief moments of originary accumulation and they perpetuate it. Direct slavery is as much the pivot upon which our present day industrialization turns as our machinery, credit, et cetera, wrote Marx as early, you know, and he's literally 28 years old when he's writing this, right, 1846. Originary accumulation merges with the capitalist conjunction of all these processes where they've never come together without the illimitation of violence brought from the interior, right, to the exterior in a manner of anthropological war that would be quickly called pacification. And this is very important to remember too. We hear these things about pacification. Where is that violence, you know, and I, again, I mentioned a book, I know he's not uh, in, the, in the best of uh, reputation right now after what he said in 9-11, but Ward Churchill's book, Pacifism is Pathology, written in 1973, is an excellent example of how this works. Yeah, yeah, in, in, in a way, right? Anthropological war, 
that would quickly be called pacification. Flows of credit and public debt operating as one of the most energetic agents, public debt, think about this, of primitive accumulation. Why I began today with, you can get 9.25% on your money with a series I US of, uh, you know, indexed inflation bonds, right? You have to go to directtreasury.gov. You can see it. You can only buy up to $10,000 per social security number. Anyway, and wars of conquest maintain and support each other mutually in a process of immediately global deterritorialization. Again, this term, this deterritorialization, right? The system of a public credit that is a public debts, right? Definitively invades Europe while the colonial system, and this is very interesting too, and very few colonial studies take this into account with its maritime trade and commercial wars served as a forcing house. The tight relationship between war and credit and the birth of the latter from the financial necessities of the former and its power of projection in guns and salt determined the global structure of the process of accumulation that started its ascent in 1492. Before the discovery of America, Blaud insists, Europeans indeed, indeed had no superiority over non-European Europeans at any time prior to 1492. Whatever the mercantile and usurious, um, usurious precedents, the origin of finance takes a new turn, an unspeakable turn, one which makes all the difference. Along with national debt, there arose an international credit system, which often conceals one of the sources of originary accumulation in this or that people. A great deal of capital, which appears in the United States without any birth certificate, was yesterday in England, the capitalized blood of children. Very interesting, huh? To go back there. Why I mentioned things about, you know, Bernard Henri Levy and rubber plantations in Africa, who, who you know, is part of the Nouveau Philosophes, you know. Badiou is Moroccan, <laughs> by the way. Althusser is, uh, uh, you know, Algerian, uh, you know, uh, uh, middle class, if you will. And inversely, more primitively, when African blood cemented the bricks and factories and banks of Liverpool and Manchester, behind the extreme mathematical sophistication of finance, there is always the brood of bankocrats, financiers, rentiers, brokers, stock jobbers, et cetera, described by Marx. Okay, so that's good. Good introduction, right? To a primitive accumulation or originary accumulation part two. So now they begin to speak about Federici and her reading of The Tempest. You know, I don't know if you've read, I, I recommend it highly. It's a great book, great original study, Caliban and the Witch, right? And she's still alive. She still gives talks, you know, and. Uh, you know, she's, she's, she's out there in some ways, you know, yeah. Um, you know, um, you know, anyway, um, Sylvia Federici, and this is page 49, does not hesitate to connect the destiny of women in Europe to that of the people colonized by Europe in a book that takes on the form of a manifesto with a title inspired by Shakespeare of the Tempest and the anti-colonialist recuperation of the character of Caliban, Caliban and the Witch. The birth of capitalism is not only synonymous with a war against the poor. This is an interesting, right? Again, it was coeval with a war against women. Yep. To subject them to the social division of labor as the enclosure of all forms of human relations, each of which passes through a new sexual order which accumulates divisions in the production and reproduction of the labor force. The debasement and demonization of women married to the devil, right? The destruction of the knowledge. And we all know, you know, I mean, you know, what's Ron Sternberg's uh, uh, film in the 1920s in Weimar, the devil is a woman, right? <laughs> you know, the notion of the femme fatale in, in cinema just has not gone away, right? In many ways, right? The destruction of knowledge they bore, the criminalization of contraception, you know, and obviously the criminalization of abortion, right? And magical practices of care took away control from women over their own bodies, which became the property of men guaranteed by the state while participating in putting the population to work, right? The conditions for assigning women to the labor of biological, economic, and affective reproduction of the labor force were thus defined. 
So it goes back to a, a great uh, play worth reading once a year, The Tempest of Shakespeare, how Sylvia Federici reworks it. Uh, I particularly like the mother witch of, uh, you know, <laughs> in the, uh, in the uh, thing. She's not really mentioned much, but, you know, she's kind of behind the scenes uh, with, with uh, Caliban and, uh, yeah. Anyway, so uh, very interesting. Um, unproductive work as the classical economist and a good number of Marxists sagely explained since it's situated before the valorization of capital and therefore non-payable work on the level of a natural resource unpaid work, right, and a common good, but regulated in the framework of nat natal and familial biopolitics fiercely promoted by mercantilism. With Maria Mies, Federici therefore can only risk a parallel between the unpaid work of reproduction performed by women paired with the appropriation of their profits by some out of male workers and the forced labors of slave slaves. And she studies the way in which the war against women aimed at disciplining them is part of the framework of a new type of patriarchy, that is the salary patriarchy. With hundreds of thousands of execution, the witch hunts were the bloodiest episode of this war against the relative autonomy and freedom of women waged since the end of the Middle Ages. And again, another very good film, The Return of Martin Gare, if you've ever seen it. Uh, it's also com commented by uh, Natalia, Natalia uh, Zenon Davis, the historian. Very good commentary on that film. Witch hunts are the, not the infamous mark of a god of the Middle Ages as described by here is histories of mentalities, but as the Sabbath of capital. And I like that. That should be, that should be a title of an essay of what's going on today with reproductive rights, right? In many ways, uh, you know, and of course, uh, you know, uh, Dialectic of Sex of uh, Shulamith Firestone. Okay, okay. so, um, you know, this goes on and, um, you know, um, um, uh, you know, the continued break of Foucault, um, you know, it is Caliban and it is not his mother, Sycorax, the sorceress whose powers and influence her son are not hidden by Shakespeare, who becomes the hero of Latin American revolutionaries, by the way. This is in the next paragraph, how the tempest is played out, you know, in Latin American, uh, you know, and in the language of Latin American, uh, Sycorax, the sorceress, right? Very interesting, right, going on. Uh, I guess everybody's seen the movie State of Siege uh, and the Uruguayan uprising, uh, Costa Stravas. He made it after Z, which was the story of the assassination of the uh, Lombardikes. State of Siege is really worth seeing. Yves Montan plays the operative in the film who's kidnapped by the guerrilla group, the Tupaneros, during that time. Yeah. And uh, yeah. That's my favorite movie, Michael. State of, State of Siege is my favorite movie now, I think. Oh, it is? Okay, yeah. cool. Okay. One of the okay. Best. I, I highly recommend well, I it. Think it's, it's certainly his best film by, 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 <laughs> in my opinion. Yeah. He made a film on Capitol too, late in his life. And he made Missing, you know, as you remember, during the, you know, the Chilean, uh, and the Latin American uh, thing. Jack Lemon, I think, was in that. But uh, Z was, uh, the, you know, it it's was Z. very good, but State yeah. of Seed was a masterpiece. Better. I think it's better. Masterpiece. Masterpiece. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and also the uh, the title of a it's a different story, but it it, it it alludes in some ways to what's going on in the Costa Stravas film by uh, Juan uh, Gostiolo, the great uh, Spanish writer, you know, uh, surrealist uh, Spanish writer. So anyway, th this is very important. So it turns and detours and and you know, the cycle of the historical reciprocity of nationalism, racism, and sexism are in every sense constitutive of the ecumenical power of capitalist enveloping of the world in the permanent war that serves as vector and tensor. This ecumene cannot be imagined without the technologies of biopower and a biopolitics contemporary with the emergence of capitalism, of which the colonies are also the laboratory. This is on page uh, 51. Um, uh, and it throws a rather harsh light on the supposedly progressive reality of the transition, which could be more uh, appropriately called, be called a continued break. And I like this, no longer progress, just think about continued break, right? In terms of reading history, not as progress, the idea of progress. So anyway, the majoritarian uh, model, you know, the, again, they begin with Foucault 
Uh, he seems to be their straw man through this uh, with, with very deep respect, but uh, they're going on. And uh, he goes on to you know, talk about the peasants war as the transition for feudalism to capitalism. I won't go over that too much. Uh, anyway, um, um, so from for Felix Guattari, right? And this this is very important. Let me let me go a little bit further up. Page fifty three, about ten lines down. The wars of subjectivity are therefore not a supplement to capital. This is important. In its subjective face, they constitute the most objective specificity of the wars of against women, the mental mentally ill, the poor the criminals, the day laborers, the workers, and more. They are not content with overcoming the adversary to negotiate a better peace treaty, according to the classic idea of interstate warfare, since their aim is precisely the conversion to subjectivity, the conformance of behavior and practices to the logic and accumulation and reproduction of capital. On our terms, President Putin. On our terms, President Xi. Yeah. Yeah, this is really what, 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 what's going down in many ways, you know? Yeah, this is dollarism. Don't give us this talk of the alternative currency too much. We, 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 we're not ready for this. You know, the world's not ready. Watch how fast we can strengthen the dollar. Do all you want with your ruble, right? And the yuan, et cetera. So I, I think this is what's going on too. It's very in, important to see this battle of currency right now. That's, that's happening in the world, okay? So in this sense, the production of subjectivity is both the first of the capitalist productions and a major object of war and civil war. The formatting of subjectivity is their strategic concern. And I guess David's out for a second, but this is the strategic concern and it is found throughout the history of capitalism. For Guattari, Guattari um, from whom we are borrowing the term, the wars of subjectivity are political wars of formatting and steering of the subjectivity needed for the production, consumption, and the reproduction of capital. They are not foreign to the intense struggles waged inside insurrectional and protest movements to define the form of organization and subjectivation of the revolutionary war machine, militancy. And I like this, the, the militancy, modes of action, strategies, and tactics. For Foucault, they form the web of resistance and the invention of an other subjectivation that is found not only in every experience of the revolutionary rupture, but also in the last displacement he was able to consider since the passage to the ethics of a militant life through parhesia, truth telling, by the way, that's, that's what that means in Greek, is itself a war against the other. You know, and he goes back to ancient Greek to, to that, that the legislature was a practice of truth telling, you know, in, in a way. So the violent processes of deterritorialization that are at the heart of primitive accumulation understood in the narrow sense of the term, even in the witch hunt and the globalization that accompanies it, are therefore, is, are, are therefore always inseparable from wars of subjectivity. So this is a very important thing. This is a kind of a, a, a very critical advance, in my opinion, on Sartre's, you know, search for a method written in 52, you know, that it's the kind of the preface introduction, if you will, to, uh, to critique of dialectical reason, of dialectic reason. Um, and, uh, you know, where Sartre tries to bring subjectivity back into Marxism, and he calls, you know, existentialism a parasitic thing. They're looking at subjectivity as being inclusive, not just as part of the system, right? It's inclusive already within it and just as an important an element. Construction of the majoritarian model of man is made male, white, and adult, transforming woman into a minority gender and the colonized into a minority race is a strategic mechanism that takes place simultaneously in the colonies of the New World and in Europe, where it was well known that this diversities provide Satan, Satan with marvelous commodities, right? In many ways, such that the first, and all of you know that Lucifer really means bringer of light, right? <laughs> right, so anyway, just to give you an idea, yeah, yeah, you know, first, first revolutionary, at least in the Western literary tradition, right? 
such that the first European construction becomes that of a little big man. And I like this too, this play upon, you know, I thought a very good film back in the day with Dustin Hoffman for those of us of, the, of that generation. I think it came out 72, if I'm not mistaken, but he plays, uh, you know, the, the, the little big man to the chief is, is grandpa. Very beautiful film. Uh, emerging from this space of terror, benefiting all the strategic exchanges in favor of the continued formation of a global proletariat. The power relations and division established by the majoritarian model became deeply linked to organizing relationships of exploitation, both in the homeland and in the peripheries, because it is with primitive accumulation and it's the continued accumulation of capitalism that the model majority men minorities, women, functions within European wage labor by being combined with class exploitation. So this is interesting. They're really looking at, you know, the issues here of gender and race, you know, before that of just class, right? Yeah, and class. The war against women produces a differentiation in a sexual division of labor that is revealed to be strategic for the history of the accumulation of capital and the struggles that oppose it. In the society, in the process of being monetized, women only have access to money indirectly through the wages of the male worker to whom the women find themselves in a situation of dependence and inferiority. Dominated according to class logic, male wage laborers become dominant in the logic of the majority minority model. Wages and their modalities of distribution are synonymous with a form of domination of women and forced promotion of the bourgeois nuclear family in the labor world, which repeats the refrain even its most revolutionary movements. Proletarian anti-feminism, to use Tonison's expression, and workers' defense of women's rights reduced to the condition of mother and homemaker go hand in hand. And this is very interesting. And I think what they're also giving us here is a kind of beginning of an explanation of why workers vote for Trump, why workers vote for Reagan. You know, we, we really have to consider this. What are these, what are these factors that are, that are happening so often, right? That, that, that. So this is very interesting. Maria Mies, proletarianization of men is based on the housewifeification of women. Thus the little white man also got his colony right? Mainly the family and a domesticated out like this, the little white man, not his colony, right? Mainly the family and a domesticated housewife. Despite some feminist critiques, the Foucaultian microphysics of Bauer reveals itself here to be a vital instrument in accounting for the way that power, and this is interesting, the notion of the microphysics of power, very good that Foucault's on, on one, right? Such that micropolitics becomes a privileged terrain of a dynamics of division, differentiation, and antagonism. In fact, the class composition of the proletariat, and this is interesting, is traversed with lines of fracture that at the origin are veritable molecular civil wars that cannot be reduced to any type of ideological conflict. Very interesting, right? Molecular civil wars. And this is it. You know, I, I'll, I'll use a phrase of Leonard Cohn. Homo homicidal bitchin in every kitchen, determining who's to serve and who's to eat, right? Everybody knows, right? That's from everybody knows. Homicidal bitchin in every kitchen, determining who's to serve and who's to eat, right? Okay, so Ashish Nandi has talked about India, the, the construction of the majoritarian model by the British colonizers still passes essentially through the same stages since the established of the colonial hierarchy of sexual identities, normality identified with the adult homo Europeanness, right? This is interesting. As most of you know, uh, John Stuart Mill worked for the uh, East Indy Company. He was a, you know, a man there. Utilitarianism came out of high British imperialism as a, as a philosophy. I, I was told that's not philosophy when I mentioned that in a philosophy class once. I got in trouble for bringing up Mill was an agent of British imperialism and why are we taking this philosophy seriously and why don't we explore anyway, but yeah. Okay, so rejecting the impotence of the effeminate, you know, full of the warrior spirit against this and you begin to see how these activities and cliches 
and this this is kind of a, you know descriptive descriptive um, you know the adjectival start to work while children like the colonized are regulated to the primitive world synonymous with a situation of inferiority that only development can correct the developing nations they're in development right <laughs> etc you know how this goes right He's having a developmental crisis, you know, he's, you know, not up to speed, etc. So, so anyway, then this is very important, uh, you know, and I think this sums it up well. The mechanism, page um, 56, of majority minority power energizes the war of subjectivities of internal colonization and external colonization by establishing hierarchies of race and sex, but also civilization. The latter civilization is perfectly performed by the Schmittian assertion, and that's Carl Schmitt, according to which Indians lacked the scientific power, again, putting the Bible to their ear, right, of Christian hyphen European rationality. The intellectual advantage was entirely on the European side. This is Carl Schmitt speaking, which also explains how the discovery of the new world could appear as an authentic epistemological event. And I recommend a, a book. It's, it's, a, it's a very great read, German, German book, The Legitimacy of the Modern Age by Hans Blumenberg. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know, Patrick, do you know this book? It's a, a yeah, Hans Blumenberg, very, very interesting book about how, how epistemologies became legitimated, right, <laughs> in terms of early modernity, right? Compensating for Galilean decentering with terrestrial imperialism, this recentering New Europe. I like the way this decentering operation of Galileo led to a terrestrial imperialist recentering of Europe, right? Very, very interesting, right? The way he does this. From the decentered subjectivity and the decentered world to that of the recentered terrestrial imperial, you know, um, uh, Europeanization of the world. So original accumulation, and this is where it goes into a little bit of, uh, you know, the etymology here, uh, you know, uh, initial by Jean-Pierre Lefebvre, or original or uh, from which the international division of labor can be traced with hierarchies that are not only of class, and this, uh, this to me is important, and, you know, um, because they're also of gender, race, and civilization. I think this is very important to keep in mind that we're very restricted in our analysis of class. We need to re rethink class, right, in many ways. In other words, an accumulation of potential and power, puissance et pouvoir, right, that, that presents simplifying the world economy and its processes of emerging by opposing the class struggle in the homeland and the race struggle in the colonies where the majority minority mechanism is operational under different modalities on both sides of the Atlantic. There is an identity of nature and differences of regimes with multiple intersections. So the, then they go into the case of Locke. And I, I don't know, uh, this, this is, you know, as most of you know, John Locke uh, was one of the most influential people on the framer of the US Constitution, is read actively in political theory, the treatise, second treatise on government, very actively read. Um, uh, uh, by him. Uh, he was a stockholder, and, and they point this out in the Royal African Company, which managed the slave trade and had a monopoly of the slave trade in West Africa. And the English model of agriculture, of, of, excuse me, agricultural model of colonization is exposed in this section by Locke. Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts about this. You know, uh, you know the natural power being put into the community, uh, which is then is asserted by the uh, Commonwealth, which has the power of the preservation of private property. John Locke is the thinker of private, private property, right? Par excellence, the one who justifies it, you know, in a way. And it's providential. Boris Johnson is a complete caricature of the John Locke school of, uh, you know, right? You know, and, but anyway, one of the thinkers of the British empire. Also someone who was involved in the currency crisis, uh, Sylvia Frederici's husband, George Cofensis, wrote a book on uh, John Locke's uh, 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 work on money. Clip Coins uh, is the name of the book about how Locke helped so solve the British currency crisis uh, many, 
many uh, moons ago in the 17th century. So this is very interesting. So, um, you know, um, so um, very, very interesting, the colonial difference, this whole section on him. And he also goes into Adam Smith. Uh, they go into Adam Smith and, um, and of course, uh, McPherson, another great book, The Possessive Individualism, uh, you know, uh, on, uh, the, on the Hobbesian universe. Very, very on political, um, 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 excuse me, uh, 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 possession, uh, possessive individualism, I'm sorry. The Theory of Possessive Individualism by, by McPherson, another very great book in this. So he's look, they're looking at the Anglo model, right, et cetera. Um, contract consent, where we still live. You know, this is on page uh, 63. Uh, the legitimate of the people, the continuous perspective on servitude and differential perspective on reason. It goes through beings incapable of governing themselves, which inside children, women, madmen, idiots, and the poor, you know, and uh, laboring poor, the idle poor, all these phrases that are used. And then the outside, the, the outside primitives and the savages, right? And of course, most of you know the Rousseauian notion of, you know, the noble savage. This is when this, is, this comes up. And of course, the social contract and in other works of his uh, too. And, uh, you know, the uh, Enfant Taleb, right? <laughs> And uh, The Wild Child, the great film about the child in the forest, right, who is trying to brought, be brought in. A great movie by Francois Truffaut, worth, worth watching at least once a year, yeah, in terms of how, how reason works. <laughs> what is the resistance to reason, <laughs> et cetera? How does one become socialized, et cetera, right? So anyway, he goes into this, the, government, the new government of the self, et cetera, and this is the, called the male majoritarian model at work brought to you by Locke and probably can be traced back to Hobbes. And of course, uh, you know, moving forward into, you know, where we are today in many ways, uh, the self-service of liberalism. Uh, you know, very interesting, um, uh, you know, the last section, and I'll read this too. I know we don't have a whole lot of time left. Um, um, the fact that some thoughts, and this is page 65, the last paragraph, before Foucault and originary accumulation. Concerning education, Locke in 1690 was a bestseller, okay, his, his, his work on education. Throughout the 18th century is a clear indication, fully resonating with the Puritan and an accountable ethics of capitalism and the system of habits that it endeavored to promote. And I like this, this phrase, system of habits, because this is what Madison Avenue is expert at. You know, and we'll see this when they get into more modern people who work in PR departments and corporations. More than a simple insurrection, I mean, excuse me, instruction, my, my apologies. It's a good slip though. It is a regulation of the whole <laughs> of conduct, which per penetrating to all departments of private and public wealth was infinitely burdensome and earnestly enforced. This is at the heart of this capitalism, capitalist civilization, to use another one of Max Weber's words, and the wars of subjectivity it promotes in the name of a proprietary universality that teaches others about their inclusion, exclusion, exclusive inclusion in the majority model of the wars of the self. Because it goes without saying that all people will be members of political and civil society when it is a question of being governed albeit with different status, the self-service of liberalism. So this is a very interesting thing. You're either a member of the club but you're not. Again, I, I mentioned another text that's very much on this level of conformity and status. status. Uh, individual and conformity in the United States by Sartre. This is a wonderful approach about how you are not granted individuality until you enter <laughs> into the club then you become part of the group. You've conformed to the group culture, right? You are not individualized, right? Yeah, yeah. It's very interesting. You're not an individual. And so it goes through. It's not our brand of individuality, he says this about the, the quote, the French. But, you know, it, it's during his time here in 1945-46, after, you know, the victory of, uh, so-called victory of World War II, right? So very interesting to think about that as well, the self-service and status 
moment uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of liberalism. So uh, then, then it'll go into Foucault on dispotifs. Maybe, uh, I don't know, it's, it's up to you guys. Uh, you know, I think this is um, uh, uh, David's left. I know he, he knows Foucault pretty well. Maybe we could pick up with uh, Foucault next week. Um, I just want to uh, mention two things here in this page 75, very important, Nazism, the climax and final solution of state racism in which Foucault sees the absolute coincidence of a total disciplinary state, of a generalized biopower, and the diffusion of the old sovereign right to kill throughout the social body was not only the suicidal result of the European biodynamics precipitated into war's ultimate and decisive phase in all political processes. The poet Ami César understood it from a completely different place as the inevitable fruit of colonization, which worked to decivilize the colonizer. This is very interesting, to decivilize the colonizer by ensuring slowly but surely, surely Europe proceeds towards savagery. You know, and this to me is very much where, uh, you know, Stiegler ends up education and stupidity in the 21st century, symbolic misery, all of these, these terms. The reason Hitler cannot be forgiven is not the crime in itself, the crime against man. It is not the humiliation of man as such. It is the crime against the white man and the fact that he applied to Europe colonialist procedures, which until then had been reserved exclusively for the Arabs in Algeria, the coolies of India, and the niggers of Africa. Very interesting, huh? Cesar's got great insight here. I mean, you know, this is the you know, one of the great, great poets of the 20th century speaking here too, right? Yeah, yeah, Ami Saza, yeah, 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 he, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so very, very interesting, yeah, in this way. So I, I think this is very interesting, you know, how, how does the biopolitical contribute to this, you know, this kind of racism in that Nazism, the final solution of state racism. Interesting, right? Very interesting. You know, yeah, and and of course you'll see, you'll see this too, right? Yeah, <laughs> and the savagery with rhetoric in films like uh, I see uh, Josh was here for a second, but Pasolini solo, you know, mm -hmm. it's with the rhetoric and the telling of the stories, right, etc. And this kind of degradation, you know, slow but systematic degradation, you know, etc. Yeah, yeah, very much so, right. So, yes, David, please. Yeah, yeah. Michael, yeah. in the yeah. view, you know, in light of the, you know, January 6th committee's findings and all of that, would they say that the pardoning ultimately of Donald Trump would be inevitable by the American government because to indict him would be too much to destabilize this entire thing? Because yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That would be the case. You know, in a way, you're dealing with a white majoritarian, you know, model mm -hmm. once again, and this is what things are working on. But you know, in a way, we're we're getting what Cesar really talked about here. You know, in a sense, mm -hmm. this, you know, and, and what Stiegler talks about we're lost its mind. The system itself has right. really lost its mind. That and being that, said, you know, obviously, you know so much about this. You know, it's wonderful. Yeah. Do you think that he would be indicted? Do you think that's on the table, or do you think that's just never going to happen? I think Latisha James is going to get him on a few things. But, I'm know, sorry. I, I think Latisha he... James and her, uh -huh. you know, the state attorney, state of New York attorney general, mm -hmm. um, will get him on maybe a couple of little things, and they'll they'll play it out in court for a long time. No, it will remain civil. I don't really civil. see. The, uh, the uh, criminal, but not criminal. Or criminal charges against them. I, I just don't see. It. I, I think that I think they're very well aware. I may be wrong, but I'm speaking from the standpoint of real mm -hmm. politics. What that would explode into, mm -hmm. you know. Like, remember, we live in a country where there's still you know 400 million guns out there, and there are people that are you know not afraid to use them. Like, yeah. We've seen this yeah. at this point. The kind of chaos we got, we have. You know, if this was 1970s and it was Richard Nixon again, and we had the similar kind of things, I would say there's a good chance, yes, we would get an indictment. But given where we are today, I, I really seriously doubt it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And also, you have to remember, too, 
Yeah, the Manhattan DA has dropped it, but not the state of New York Attorney General. But Keisha James is still involved. Yeah. Yeah, but that's just the civil suit. That's not criminal. Yes, no, I know that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, very good, uh, Patrick. It's a great film, by the way, Italian film, Investigation of a Citizen of, of Suspicion. It's a wonderful film to see in this light, by the way. A masterpiece. Yeah, if you haven't seen it, you should get it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Michael, when you were studying philosophy, I was just curious, when you did your dissertation or graduate work, what was your, your dissertation or thesis topic about? What did you write about? It was Heideggerian Marxism. Uh -huh. Yeah, a kind of combination of those two things. Yeah. I started in the existentialist with Camus, with Albert Camus, you know, see. philosophy of, of the absurd and his mm -hmm. novels and you know, his novels being exemplary in terms of articulating problems of absurd existence and you know existential angst and these kind mm -hmm. of things. pretty much part of the trend at the time but i tried to read you know read read his whole work you know i read the fall as an attempt mm -hmm. to settle accounts with sart i read mm -hmm. uh, read the uh, plague as, as his best one so uh, you know his best not uh, novel because I really liked the character of Ryu because he was very ethical in what he did. So all, all of these moments were uh, yeah very crucial to me. So I started with Camus, but then I went back to Heidegger, more systematic. You know, Camus was never a systematic philosopher. You know, he was just right. a, a novelist and poet and, you know, very sensual a man of sensuality, right, in, in a way, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in a sense. And philosopher, philosopher of nature in some ways, and mm -hmm. of the other day in, in a different way. And Heidegger was more the traditional, you know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. that moment. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I was always looking, I, you know, they didn't develop programs uh, until later for psychoanalysis and philosophy together, because I really liked, when I started to read Lacan, I, I kind of took the luck on very mm -hmm. much, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, in a way, and uh, yeah, this this was very important to me. But uh, yeah, but it was always always you know embedded in the existential you know subjectivity in a way, you know instead of instead of uh, you know the kind of subjectivity they're talking about. I find this really a great extension on Sartre and subjectivity, and the theory. very very interesting elaboration and advance on existential subjectivity, even though it's still existential in many ways, of course, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but they, they make it into, you know, uh, a much more social, you know, problem, right, than, you know, individual, and, you know, et cetera. Right. So As again, things moved forwards with the novel, were you at all influenced by someone like Thomas Pynchon? where gravity's rainbow, it seems like so much of it is about the annihilation of the rocket. And then there's all of these decentered, complicated, you know, streams of consciousness that, you know, animate the central theme of saying, the world is going to explode. What does it matter? I've given you these huge crenellations of language, but it's the theorem of death in the end. Yes. No, I understand that. I was asked to do a, uh... Uh, a seminar many, many years ago by a group of people at NYU on uh, 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 Gravity's Rainbow and Hegel's phenomenal uh, spirit. So, uh, uh, yeah, so that I, that was a little bit too much. But anyway, I haven't read it in years. And, but I like Pynchon very much. I actually like the satirical print, and I love Pynchon. I like The Crying of Lot 40. Oh, uh, that's a great much. book. I, I really think that could be a great movie, you know, mm -hmm. whereas I don't think Gravity's Rainbow would make a great movie. We already have Dr. Strange love to begin with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, no, it's a massive mine and, you know, not really talked about much. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but uh, yeah, no, it's, it's a great work. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. just so big. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, I mean, my hope is, I mean, the, the, the problem I have with philosophy, it's always dehistoricized. It's, you know, most departments are really terrible in not bringing in the historical yeah, element, you know, and the social is sometimes taken out too. And you, you know, you get into, you know, what I would just call, you know, mental masturbation rather than real problems. This is, this is, yeah, yeah. To me, you know, with philosophy departments and philosophy per se, you know, in, in many ways. Mm -hmm. So I like stuff like this because it's grounded. I mean, it, it may seem it's, you know, somewhat, you know, associationist, it's, it's uh, free floating at times. 
You know, it's not in the form that is not, you know, what we're accustomed to, but at the same time, for me, it's opening up many avenues of thought, pathways, you know, passageways. So I see this as facilitation, you know, what Freud would call freyage, you know, in, in the German, you know, where it facilitates a channel, right? And so you can start working with channels, you know, communication, channels of strategy, you know, and all of this. So this, this opens up a very different uh, different approach to uh, you know philosophical endeavor. And I, I like the I like this thing about Althusser. We must do the history of the question, right? <laughs> Why did the question get asked this way? You know, yeah. Do you feel in that it's a little bit of a different question, but the Freudian concept of Nachtraglichkeit, yeah. do you feel that that in some way is coming out of Hegel, like the idea that in your personal history, if you look back on some memory after you've say, as an adolescent, you've had an orgasm, you know, as a boy or a little girl, you realize if your uncle was molesting you or whatever was happening, you know, that now experience is recontextualized in Nachtraglischkeit to say, you understand your past very differently by the force and the, um, the presence of the moment you're in as an adult that's got more awareness. That does seem slightly like what Hegel was writing about in his conceptions of history of saying, you know, if you realize later on what's happening in a particular kind of revolution socioeconomically, you could look back and understand an earlier period of history really very differently what was going on there like yeah i mean just to answer it in philosophical language i'm sorry just the problem with that, you know hegel had this notion of the olive of minerva takes light at death thus. right i right. mean re reflect and recollect all the events of the day so mm -hmm. philosophy is a retrospective nocturnal act, deferred activity kind of mental activity. So there's a there's much very much in common with Freud on that way. Although for Freud is talking about the formation of the neurosis, I think more more when he uses the term, right? The, the deferred activity was not something that was not acted upon, right? And is deferred mm -hmm later date, right? And it, it maybe create the neurotic <laughs> space, in there, right? That something's not charging in, in the right way, neurologically speaking, with the, you know, the synapse, et cetera. Whereas in Hegel, it's really about the recollection of the day, right? The recapitulation of all the events of the day. To me, the thinking we have to do, I'll always like this metaphor, I think about it a lot, is the Ubermensch of Nietzsche walking in the shadow of the Isle of Minerva, right? I mean, this is the day's events, you know, the Ubermensch, how does one overcome the Isle of Minerva and that kind of piety of thinking and that recollection? And how do we escape this kind of memory of the past in order to build something new into the uncharted on a, you know, new, new, new events, right? How do we get out of this, you know, kind of historical recollection in a sense? And Nietzsche seems to be pointing in that direction but doesn't have, I mean, I mean, I've been rereading because of this, this word. I mean, I've been rereading, I think I brought this last, the will to power, yeah, were, mm -hmm. the, 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 the 1060 fragments. And I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, the, the thoughts he has there, and you begin to see the Deleuze, Guattari, they're all there, and, and, and Aliez, Lazarato, it really in many other ways, many other thinkers out there, you know, maybe of not that ill, are really recapitulating much of the stuff he's got here in many ways. And, and the problem, listen, I, 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 I was born a Marxist, I guess, in some ways. I mean, I came out, you know, anti-capital very early, you know, I, I was good with uh, playing poker and money and stuff, but I hated, I hated the, the system and what it did to people. And in a way, I like, you know, jerking it around, but, you know, of course, it's going to get the best of you. Ultimately, you can't really beat it individually. But, but all, all to say, um, you know, when you read Nietzsche, you begin to get, you know, like these parameters of these paths, you know, that are very different open up a kind of different horizon in some ways that you can bring back. You know, you see this in Lazzarato and, you know, there's always this, this work on originary accumulation. What is capitalism? What is expropriation versus appropriation? You know, these wars against and subjectivity, but you begin to see this Nietzschean energy. You know, it's a very different kind of energy that's opening up possibilities beyond moralism, beyond the, you know, how do we form value? How do we, 
reevaluate values, et cetera. So for me, this is very important. I like this attempted, it's not a it's not a synthetic moment, it's more of a parallel movement to me, you know. And in a way, I'm kind of working with this with a couple of people. I don't know, Josh is not on, Josh is, is, is working uh, on this too. The convergence, you know, how things converge in certain moments. They might not fit exactly, but really the whole, you know, thinking of, uh, you know, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, Josh, I'm going to let you, uh, you, we can stop the recording here. I'll, I'll stay on, but let's stop it if you don't mind posting Okay, it. sure, yeah.